Um, welcome to all of you who are able to join us in person. It's hard to believe that it's been almost three years since the last time that we came together for a Marine Forum in person in 2020. That was early spring, just before the world shut down for a little while. And also welcome to those of you who are joining online. Hopefully the tech will go a bit better than it did in 2020 when Marielle was walking around with a laptop and a phone trying to record <laughs> everything that was happening. So we're really pleased to have you join us today. Um, I'm Alice from Whale and Dolphin Conservation Shorewatch Program, and together with my colleagues, Katie and Emma, also from WDC, and with Nick, Andrew, and Marielle from SNAS, we're delighted to have you join us at this Marine Forum. As many of you will know, this year is extra special because it marks 30 years of the SNAS program. And so it's fitting that we're celebrating this by hosting this uh, Marine Forum in this beautiful venue in their new home at the University of Glasgow. So now in its fifth year, the Marine Forum was originally developed as a knowledge exchange event to celebrate the incredible body of citizen scientists volunteers who work with our two organizations. This collaboration has gone from strength to strength and has brought together an ever wider community of volunteers, researchers, organizations, and stakeholders with an interest in marine mammals and conservation to share perspectives and learn from each other. So to that end, we've taken the theme of collaboration for today's Marine Forum. And through the upcoming program of talks and interactive sessions, you'll hear tales of how marine science and conservation has evolved from organizations largely working in isolation in the past to increasingly developing collaborations, working together and developing techniques to do research and achieve conservation goals. Now, before we're going to get started with all the speakers that you want to hear, some really boring quick housekeeping rules. Um, there are no fire drills expected today, so if you do hear a fire alarm, I'm afraid it is real. So if you can, put your ground and code because it's wet outside, and go to the nearest, uh, find the nearest exit, which in all of your cases will be behind you. Um, the master station is just outside the yard, the whole of the front open, so that's where we need to go if you hear a fire alarm. Uh, for those of you joining us online, I'm looking, I'm hoping that my camera is the one I need to look at. The session will be recorded, recorded, so please make sure that you keep your microphones on mute and please do not turn your cameras on because that kind of interferes with the recording and we really don't want to see what you were doing at home at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> um, the programs for everyone has posted boards outside which have, which have a little QR code on it, so you can scan that and it will be on your phone um, for you to have. It's also on the Facebook event page, so that's for the people online as well. On the Facebook event page, that is where we share the program. Please do use social media. If you're going to tweet or post about the event, please use the hashtag Marine Forum 2020 so we can collate that all at the end of the day. For those of you in the room today, there are a few photographers around, so if you don't want your picture um, shared after the event, just let one of us know, and we'll make sure that that doesn't happen. And then I guess it's like Al said, it's an absolutely packed program today, so uh, we have actually decided to give the speakers the time to speak while we're in this room, but during and uh, not have much time for questions. But please do grab them and ask them all the things you want to ask them during the coffee breaks and in the interactive sessions this afternoon because they are there to, for you to speak to. The one exception to that rule is our keynote speaker of today, who um, will take questions. Um, so you will have seen all the program potentially. As Alice said, our theme for today is um, the evolution of marine mammal science and how collaboration has become a big part of that. And our keynote speaker for today is an absolute force at all of these things. Um, she's been at the forefront of marine mammal science for decades um, and is an absolute, an absolute um, example of how collaboration should work. Now, I do list all of her achievements, but we will be here until tomorrow, and really, you'll really just want to hear from her. So, can I please get a really, really big round of applause? We are very thrilled she's here for Ilsa Hall. <laughs> Well, thanks very much to everybody for coming. Um, when the team asked me to give this opening talk and said that the theme of the forum was collaboration, um, I thought I'd share with you some of my thoughts on teamwork and, and working um, in cooperation with other scientists and maybe some examples of some of the work that I've been involved with over the last 30 years. <laughs> um, oh, point that way. Next. Down on the right. Yeah. 
it was working. See if you can get that to work for me. If not, I'll just say next slide, please. And you can I can do that for now. While yeah. we, yeah. I'll keep the pointer then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if the pointer works. <laughs> yeah. That's the trouble with being first. <laughs> the table, um, so why is teamwork um, and collaboration in marine mammal sites and Australians response really important? Well, if you have a mass stranding pilot whales such as this, you know, isn't it the case that you just need a bunch of volunteers like we have here um, and a few experts to help guide the people to know what to do? Um, and that's clearly really important in the acute phase. But if you want to know what's the underlying causes of these phenomena, then it's important to, um, to bring other people into the the fold next please and what's interesting my thoughts were well has this collaboration in general in science changed over time are we are we thinking about collaboration cooperation ourselves in isolation because we are a taxon based group we're just working with one set of species maybe we're we're different to everybody else uh, next please so what i thought was i'd look at some of the data as you do when you're a scientist <laughs> and um this study looked at the authorship of papers, uh, scientific papers over time. Um, and this is the average number of authors per paper since the 1900s or 1910s. And it's increased fivefold over that period. Next, please. Um, and they also looked at the maximum number of authors in any given year. So um, the paper with the most authors, and then how many was that? Um, and that sort of bumbled along until about 2000. And then there were two big. Um, jumps here I think it's to do with the genome project and then two amazing papers one with the large hadron collider team um, smashing protons together in the Higgs boson lot through over 3,000 authors I wouldn't want to be the one to cite that paper <laughs> anyway we're now in this era in general of big science so are we any different to to that and has that been always the case um, with with our discipline next please well, if we look back in time, and this is, I think, Paul before looking around before a lot of people were in, even born in this room. Um, the first post I this Denver virus outbreak in 1988, which I was involved with. Um, next, please. We actually were caught a bit short, to say the least. We had a very few marine mammal specialists, even in, within across Europe. Um, I think there was about 12 people in the marine sea mammal research unit um, and some uh, other marine scientists in, in Europe. Um, mostly population dynamics and foraging ecology, um, but not much at all in the disease front. Um, so the disciplines that we had uh, at our disposal to respond to this were pretty limited, especially the wildlife veterinarians and epidemiologists. Um, and wildlife, uh, sort of wildlife veterinary uh, research and uh, uh, approaches, again, were still in their infancy at that time. Uh, amazingly, we had pretty limited knowledge of the species. In fact, just in the mid 1980s, we didn't even know when harbour seals mated. And so Don Harwood and Mike Friedak sent uh, Professor Paul Thompson, who most of you know, up to Einhallow with a small Mark II Zodiac and an outboard and told him to stay there and do a PhD until he'd come back and found out all he could about harbour seal ecology. He did actually find out when they mated. It wasn't during the molt. <laughs> Um, but that was only a few years before this outbreak, so we were we were struggling. Virological techniques, of course, were also limited, so um, we didn't have the, the DNA and the RNA techniques that we do now. So the response we had to come up with was pretty um, broad ranging, and we had to be very flexible, and we had to have cross-disciplinary knowledge. And so a lot of us, particularly me, was dabbling into areas that I probably knew, well, I didn't know anything about. <laughs> thinking that I could learn very quickly and you can quite quickly get into kind of hot water um, thinking that you're a specialist and can pick up this knowledge quite quickly when actually you need years of experience. So that's one of the messages is that about the interdisciplinary um, in nature of what we do um, is really important. Next, please. So do we need now to assemble these large teams to tackle critical questions in our field? Next, please. Well, our knowledge has increased, um, so that's an important sort of factor in, in increasing the complexity uh, because the questions are more complex, so we need to, to um, have the tools to be able to do that. And you'll hear a lot about that this afternoon with the different um, approaches that are coming on stream now. And so the size and composition of our research teams has increased. Next. 
And also we need to maximize those field opportunities. Um, this work is very expensive. Um, it's getting more and more expensive um, as you get in the field. And so I think we've, we've understood that those field uh, opportunities are really critical um, to, to uh, forward the field. Next, please. And so we do now recognize that this collaboration is critical. Um, next, please. So one of the examples of um, a good collaboration, and some of it was a forced collaboration, but it worked out quite well, was the response um, to the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. And this involved not just um, the scientists, but also the lawyers and the policymakers. So I'd like to just run through um, some of the story behind um, the collaboration and cooperation um, that, that arose from this uh, work. In many of you may remember April 2010, uh, the drilling platform in the Gulf of Mexico exploded and between July and September when the well was sealed, millions of barrels of oil spilled into the Gulf of Mexico. And you can see the slick here from uh, the satellite image. Next, please. And in the US, under the Oil Pollution Act, there's something called a Natural Resources Damage Assessment, or NERDA, and this means that the NOAA, the National Marine Fisheries Service, uh, in this case for, for the marine life, um, have to assess the damage that has been caused, um, and so that any compensation can be recommended to restore that resource, and that's really not that easy when you're talking about marine resources, it might be more straightforward for a terrestrial spill, um, but not only did the team then have to get together and understand what the damage was, they had to assess how that, that resource was going to be uh, repaired, if you like, in, in future years. And you can see here with the, the greys, the, the extent of the slick, um, and there are a lot of different uh, marine mammal uh, populations in this area. There are the Bay Sound and Estuary dolphins here in orange. Um, and then there's a coastal dolphin population, some um, offshore shelf, uh, uh, bottlenose dolphins, and then the oceanic marine mammals, particularly um, the, the sperm whales and the resource dolphins. So the team decided to concentrate um, their efforts on the Barataria Bay bottlenose dolphins. Um, next, please. This is two reasons. One was that the slick had actually uh, encroached into that bay area quite considerably, and there was a lot of coastal damage, uh, not just to the seabirds and, and the dolphins, but also to the to the sea grasses and also Mississippi Sound. Um, and so um, it, was, it was deemed that those probably were the, the animals most at risk. Next, please. And three strands um, were put together when the response was um, put, uh, decided upon. One was to look at live dolphins, so the animals that were still remaining in the population and do health assessments. And this was possible because um, a big program of health assessments for live capture release for bottlenose dolphins had been started by the National Marine Fisheries Service um, some 10, 20 years before. So there was a lot of background data for different populations on the East Coast, but also the Sarasota Bay bottlenose dolphin project, which most of you may have heard of, um, had been capture release dolphins in Florida since the 1970s. So there's a lot of expertise to be able to do uh, the capture release, even in an area that had never been studied before. Um, of course, the strandings were really important, looking at stranded animals and um, collecting tissues for um, evaluation and um, then follow ups with observational studies, taking um, photo ID for survival and reproduction um, assessment and uh, biopsy samples for um, looking particularly at other potential drivers, because obviously if you're going to take a company like BB to court, <laughs> you've got to make sure that the reason for the damage is, is the, the pollution and not some other cause. And so they would have argued that if you hadn't done the differential diagnosis that oh, well, some of these dolphins could have been dead for other reasons. So we had to look at, the, look at those uh, potential confounders. Next, please. So the capture release um, health assessments, um, you can see you need a Chinese army for this kind of work. Um, and uh, it requires a lot of expertise and um, uh, uh, voluntary help as well. Next, please. And in terms of the, the physical exam um, and the different tissues and samples that were collected, um, it would have worked with ultrasound, so you need radiologists, then there were morphometrics, but bloods were taken for haematology, for endocrinology, immunology, toxicology, physiology, any other ology, <laughs> uh, respirology, <laughs> and biopsy samples as well for, for looking at genetics. So 
a huge team of expertise. And again, as I said earlier, trying to do that with a small group of people that are not experts in those fields would have been really difficult. So um, it was really important to, to bring together as many experts in those fields um, as possible to, to do a good job. Next, please. So what did they find? Well, the, the Barataria Bay dolphins were five times more likely to have moderate to severe lung disease. These are the ultrasound images. Um, as you can see, this alveolar interstitial syndrome was much higher in the Barataria than the controls. And as I say, it was really important that they had these um, comparative populations, Sarasota Bay and um, some of the other uh, areas, Charleston, with the other species, so like the turtles that were affected, they didn't have any baseline. So it's really hard to assess what the damage was um, in comparison to what you would see in, in, a, in a normal population. And overall lung disease was much higher, again, in the Barataria Bay animals. Next, please. Adrenal hormones. Um, normally animals, uh, when they're captured, would have a stress response. So the Sarasota Bay animals, you can see here, you would have a, an increase in cortisol um, and also aldosterone in these species. But in the Barataria Bay animals, um, quite a few of these animals didn't respond at all. So 44% had lower than the minimum ever measured in other studies. Um, they also had other conditions like reduced glucose and potassium increase. So there was sort of differential diagnosis was hypodrenocorticism. Um, next, please. Um, body condition, the animals were underweight, 25% were significantly underweight, so this is the length mass ratio, um, and you can see in the blue dots were all uh, much higher for the Sarasota animals than the Barataria Bay animals. Next, please. For the strandings, there had been a, a minor um, unusual mortality event before the spill, um, but post-spill, you can see 2010 and 2011, for, especially for Louisiana, um, they were really much higher than they'd been before. And in fact, the highest, most sustained strandings rate ever recorded for Louisiana. And again, good differential diagnosis in terms of no evidence for morbidly virus toxins or brucella as being the causes of death for those. So that would be a damage assessment that could be attributed to the oil and therefore the company would have to recompense for that. Next, please. Decreased survival, the follow-up found much lower uh, survival rates for Barataria Bay and Mississippi Sound compared to the other populations that have been studied, Charleston and Sarasota Bay, uh, up in the 90%. So uh, again, this all brought together a uh, um, uh, damage that was uh, ascribed as lost dolphin years. So how many years of dolphin life had been lost um, because of this event? Next, please. Um, these were all the findings, lung disease, low adrenal hormones condition. So the overall prognosis was pretty poor in, in a lot of cases, poor or grave, that was assessed by the veterinarians. And um, high mortality, decreased long-term survival, and they had poor reproductive outcome as well. So in the follow-up, some of the dolphins uh, had um, lost their calves. This is a female pushing around a dead calf. Oops, we seem to have lost it. <laughs> Next, please. So the... All the data was put together in a population model and some clever statisticians, Len Thomas in particular from, uh, from St. Andrews helped with estimating what the recovery rate for the population would be post spill. So you can see it was um, estimated to be declining 10 to 15 years after the spill and then it would take 50 years to recover. Um, and in fact, that's what they've seen um, in, the, in the post spill follow up assessments. So that the, the trajectories have been reasonably accurate. Um, next, please. But in order to make sure um, what was done in a, in a quite a, a rushed and rapid response um, time, because obviously it needed to get something done quickly, they put together a consortium for advanced research on marine mammal health assessments. So this is 30 scientists over nine organisations all brought together, and I was involved as the chair of the Science Advisory Board, to follow up with, the, with all this response and to make sure that the work that was done was robust and to see if indeed the predictions that they made um, about the population were, were indeed holding up. And I have to say that, that that's true. There's still quite a few animals out in the population that have a uh, poor prognosis. Um, that's not really the end of the story as well. So the restoration, um, they had uh, 18 billion pounds of restorative uh, funding. And one of the projects that they're going to do is to um, re- uh, direct the Mississippi River, which is going to put a lot of fresh water into Barataria Bay, which will decrease the salinity 
and therefore the dolphins will have a freshwater impact which results in high skin lesion rates and high mortality. So the predictions are now that even after all this work, the restoration for one part of the ecosystem that's been damaged is now going to cause long-term damage to another part of the ecosystem. Um, so there's a big discussion, shall we say, going on at the moment, um, but it looks like the, 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 the Mississippi uh, diversion is gonna go ahead. So it's a bit, bit of a sad story really. Next, please. How am I doing for time? Okay. <laughs> um, of course, we all know that there are a multitude of stresses on marine ecosystems, and here's a little list of a few climate conditions, pollution, we know fisheries, parasites, pathogens. Um, and again, how do we assess the impact of these multiple stresses? Um, so one of the projects that I'm involved in now, again, which is a multidisciplinary collaborative study, is trying to get to grips with this. Next, please. Um, and again, driven by some of the legislation in the US, um, the response to stresses across different levels, which can range from molecular to ecosystem, is important in different um, uh, degrees, especially for management. So we can say that molecular um, uh, responses are pretty sensitive to detecting change. Uh, and then as you go up towards uh, organ axes and, and individuals, um, you can still see that uh, response to, to a stressor. But in terms of relevance for management, you need to get all the way up to ecosystem level um, where you can say there has been a change and therefore a management strategy needs to come into place. Um, and so how do you do that when your sensitive responses are down here and your ecosystem requirement um, change measures for management are, are at the other end of the scale? So um, the team put together this idea um, based on the Population Consequences of Disturbance study, which was a National Academy of Sciences project um, that some of the, the, the guys from uh, CML Research Unit were involved in, um, uh, to look at multiple stresses. So you've got your drivers down here on the left and your exposure to stresses, which uh, will result in the response, which can be measured to some extent in changes in individual health. Um, and so particularly if they affect reproduction and survival, that could go then on to uh, uh, affect vital rates and therefore population dynamics and abundance. So this big blob in the middle, the individual health box, is what we're now trying to focus on as one of the, the key um, uh, measurement areas that we can uh, get to grips with um, in order to try and see how we can understand ecosystem change. Next, please. So this is the complicated model that they've come up with called PCOMs. So you've got multiple individuals within uh, a population that you're trying to assess uh, any health changes in, a physiological change, behavioral change, which will affect your vital rates. Um, and then on top of the layers of individuals, we now have layers of multiple stresses. So how do they respond to different stresses? And if those stresses are acting through the same pathway, can we then understand what that uh, consequence of that um, multiple impact can uh, is going to be next? So the structure of the project is a working group with experts in animal behaviour, bioacoustics, uh, behavioural response, toxicology and epi, risk assessment, stress physiology, population biology, stats modelling, and physiological ecology. So straight away, you've got a whole bunch of folks there with lots of different disciplines. Um, and within those fields expertise within marine mammals, um, which again is, is pretty important. So to, to get all that lot together has been quite a challenge, but uh, we managed to do it. <laughs> Next, please. So the, the um, can you go back one? Sorry. So the three case studies that they're um, working on are, uh, does the poor health of the dolphins impacted by the deep water rise and affect their ability to avoid vessel collision so in terms of that adrenal response? Um, so that's one study that's um, ongoing. Um, they're also estimating the interactions between multiple stresses that are driving the North Atlantic right whale towards extinction. Many of you know that those animals are now getting um, uh, vessel strikes because their range has moved up into the Canadian waters, um, but there are other potentials then for um, interactions with fisheries and um, prey availability. So that's another uh, big project with the North Atlantic right whale team. And then finally, does stress 
challenge interacts with effects of other stresses on foraging and reproduction in northern elephant seals and that's with the um, University of Santa Cruz this team that have been working on northern elephant seals at, uh, for some years. Okay so clearly we all know that the world is changing and that we've got all these different um, anthropogenic impacts but I didn't think things are going to get any more simple in future they're going to get more complicated and so that's why we definitely need to work in collaboration and cooperation next please and then on top of that we've got impacts of global climate change so how do we bring all of that do we need to bring in climate scientists into the field as well as um, those physiologists and ecologists and, and, and people on the ground within marine mammal teams next please um, from an individual personal point of view i would say um, that it's a lot of fun to work with people. You get to work with some of the most interesting and exciting people. You get to go to fun places around the world. You get to experience different cultural um, things that you wouldn't do if you hadn't had the chance to, to work with these people. So next, please, I would say don't get caught napping. Go out and make friends. Don't, don't tolerate megalomania. <laughs> uh, next, please. And... Um, I know this is a bit naff, but it's like those adverts, you know, that you think, oh God, this advert is so naff, but I'm going to remember it. So <laughs> teamwork makes dream work. And um, let's try and keep that in mind and keep making friends and keep talking to each other and having lots of fun working together. Like I do <laughs> and do. <laughs> Thanks very much. Hello everyone, I'm Andrew Brownlow and I'm giving you a rerun of the talk that we presented at the SMAS Forum in November 2022 because I think the audio of that particular recording was, wasn't was great. So hopefully this will be a little bit more clear and um, should be able to be cover most of the things that we talked about um, on the day. Um, the purpose of, of this talk was to try and give an overview of 30 years of Strandings investigation and to um, highlight some of the the reasons that the um, the Strandings network and the volunteer network um, had been um, so uh, successful um, over the over the, those three decades and this was presented in association with my colleagues on the scheme um, Marielle and Nick. So this is a marine animal that has stranded in Scotland and once this gets reported to uh, one of the, the SMAS team, a number of things can happen to it. We can log the, simply log the recording um, and that forms part of our long term strandings data sets on the what has stranded, where has it stranded and when did it come in. And in some cases uh, due to either logistics or the condition of the animal, that's all that we have recorded for some of our data. Um, in some cases, we collect samples from these animals, either through the volunteer network or directly ourselves. And currently we have around about 17,000 uh, tissue samples that are frozen and um, many more thousand fixed tissues and uh, preserved tissues, which are used or can be used for further analysis. And these samples are available to anyone that wants to use them for uh, studies or their own analysis. Um, if you are interested in this, then please get in touch with us and we can discuss how we can we can collaborate on that. And there's a number of cases that we're able to collect more information about the individual. So that can range from morphometrics, simple girth measurements, length measurements, blubber thickness measurements, through to collecting the animal or going to the animal and doing a diagnostic necropsy on it uh, with the purpose of assessing the cause of death that, uh, that is the most likely reason this animal has stranded. So these are the scores on the doors for the strandings over the last three decades. Um, we've had just under 14,000 strandings um, reported to us. Um, just over half of these have been seals, 53%, and of those seals, half of those have been grey seals. 20% um, have been harbour seals and 30% we haven't been able to establish what type of seal it is, probably because it was too decomposed. And that split between the 
grey seal and harbour seal is pretty representative of the current uh, population. The grey seal, as many of you probably know, are doing very well around Scotland. Their populations are increasing year on year. Um, and sadly, the harbour seal is, is going in the opposite direction with um, some serious declines from uh, regions around the Scottish coastline. Looking at cetaceans, um, we have had just over 6,000 cetaceans reported to them, and the majority of those, 40 odd percent of them, have been the harbour porpoise. This is the most numerous cetacean, the smallest cetacean we have around our coast as well, and it, uh, it is also a coastal species. So, for all of those reasons, it makes up the majority of our strandings data set. Um, after that, about a third of the animals are pelagic delphinids. This has uh, got a number of different species in it, but they're things such as uh, common dolphins, striped dolphins, white beak dolphins, etc. And then um, less than 10% of them are the Mr. Seats, the baleen whales. So um, there's obviously more data on, on these individual speciation, but that's the broad overview of what we see. So this is the um, number of strandings that have been reported to SMAS since 1992. And I think I showed this slide really most years. It just gets slightly longer. Um, the blue are the cetaceans, the orange are the pinnipeds, the seals and the sharks and marine turtles. You can hardly see, you can see they make up a very small proportion of our total stranding cases. And I guess there's a couple of things to kind of highlight in there. The, um, the big peak in 2002 was the uh, Fosan distemper outbreak, the seal um, epizootic that occurred then. Um, and from about 2010, there's been a steady increase year on year of both cetaceans and seals that have been reported into, into SMAS. Um, interestingly, if we look here, the from 2020, 21 and 22, um, the impact of the pandemic was not as severe as we expected in terms of the cases that were reported in in 2020 and 2021. Um, uh, it's not complete yet for 2022, obviously. Um, I mean, the pandemic clearly had a huge impact on what we were able to do in terms of response and necropsies and sending out volunteers. But in terms of actual strandings that were reported, there doesn't seem to be a major decrease over this period of time. If we look at the distribution of where things have stranded, this heat map here just shows the, the density of cases. And uh, unsurprisingly, um, they correlate very well with the coastline. Um, but the main point of this is, is that they, they really there is every part of the coastline we have had pretty much, um, we've had strandings reported from them. Um, the QR code uh, that's up in the top left hand corner, this links to these data which are in a map which is interactive. So if you are interested in tunneling into this data in a bit more, more detail, then if you follow that uh, QR code to the, uh, the batch geo map, you can select based on really whatever attribute you're interested in, species, time of year, location, etc. The one thing that I would say is that um, although we've got had good co good representation around the coastline, there has very clearly been an increased um, reporting effort and the speed of reporting it over the last decade. And uh, one of the reasons for that, again, unsurprisingly, is the increase in mobile phone use and distribution and therefore the, um, the functionality of social media and particularly WhatsApp, which is personally is something that we use a lot through our, our network. Um, this map that I found for the for the GSN network, the mobile phone network, um, covers um, the coverage in 2005. And the thing that's, that struck me is, is that the, the green area shows those, those areas which were only suitable in 2005 to have voice calls. And even there, it was a little bit ropey. Um, if you wanted to have any data at all, um, certainly it was before 4G to be able to send kind of um, cheap data and high volumes of data, then there really wasn't very much available other than small areas of the coast of Aberdeen and down um, south of uh, south of Edinburgh. So the intervening periods, the, the data coverage, although it's not perfect around Scotland, has got a lot better. And I think that's been the main function and the main reason why we've seen an increase of, of stranding reporting um, over that period. So if we look at those data in a little bit more uh, detail, um, and this is just again showing the, the density map of strandings by species. So 
Um, the map here shows the distribution of long fin pilot whale strandings um, of, of single animals um, that we've had uh, over the last three decades, um, exemplified here by this uh, very poorly thin animal that stranded in Loch Corisk uh, a year or so ago. But you can see that the distribution is pretty much as you'd expect for a a pelagic deep ocean species that normally should be 80 to 100 miles off the um, northwest coast of Scotland feeding on the shelf edge um, in that a lot of the the main areas are facing the sort of Atlantic and in the on the western coast however however if we look at the distribution of mass strandings of longfin pilot whales which is shown on this plot here um, we can see that it's a slightly different pattern. Sure, there are cases as we'd expect and as represented from the single strandings, which are on the Atlantic facing coastline of the Northwest. But we've also had cases down in the East and the, certainly the mass stranding event of 2012 down in the Firth of Tay and Firth of Forth, which is shown here on the, on the splodge just outside Edinburgh. Um, that was very unusual. These are animals that were very much not in their normal habitat. If we look at the actual distribution of cetacean mass strandings over the past three decades, certainly over the last 10 years, we've seen a notable increase of both frequency of magnitude of these of these cases. Um, and this does not seem to be to do with uh, reporting effort. This is real. This is there is there is something that has has caused over the last 10 years for mass strandings of these species to increase. And the species that are involved in this are long fin pilot whales, as we've been talking about, uh, but also short beak common dolphins and bottlenose dolphins. And there was a very large bottlenose dolphin mass stranding in the Cromarty Firth only last year, um, which, which was actually one of the largest um, that we've ever had um, in Scotland. Um, but it still is not the biggest. Um, and that is probably also worth saying is that compared to historical records and compared to other parts of the world where many hundreds of these animals can sometimes mass strand, thankfully in Scotland, we still don't have quite as, as significant uh, a, a larger mass stranding events as, as has happened elsewhere. So looking at some more patterns in the, in the strandings data, um, this plot here, shows two different things. The the blue line is all other cetacean species apart from the ones that are displayed here in, in the bar charts, which are the fin whales, humpback whales and say whales. So these are the great whales. These were animals that were particularly um, targeted during the period of, of industrial whaling. And um, although there is a general increase of all cetacean species, it does seem that the, again, the number of strandings of fin whales and humpback whales has increased, particularly again over the past decade. And this could be um, good news or it could not be good news. It, it, the good news is, is that this may be a possible indication of the recovery of some of these great whale populations after the uh, embargo on, on commercial whaling, which happened in the mid 1980s, these populations are beginning to recover. And it is possible that there are simply more whales around Scotland these days than there, than there were when, the, when this uh, program uh, first began in the 1990s. Alternatively, of course, it could be that there's an increased mortality of these animals, which obviously isn't as good. And in a moment, I'll explain um, one of the reasons that we think that might be the case. If we also look at the um, other species that we have around here, we can see um, this is a graph of um, four different species, um, Atlantic white-sided dolphin, some white big dolphins, which are in the bottom, which we see as kind of cooler adapted species. These are uh, animals that, are, that tend to be found in cooler waters. And then striped dolphins and common dolphins, um, which are warm adapted species. And again, over the 30 years, there's been a big uptick about a decade ago when the um, number of um, warm adapted species, so common dolphins and striped dolphins, seem to have increased around the coast of Scotland. Um, and this could be possibly because the populations are shifting due to climate change. Well, we think it probably is due to these populations shifting due to climate change. And therefore the habitat range of common dolphins and striped dolphins is extending further north. And this potentially has impact on the cooler water species who are either being also displaced further north away from Scotland and therefore they no longer show up in the strandings record or potentially being squeezed out due to, to habitat competition. 
So if you want to understand the cause of death, um, we are the, the, the easiest way to do this is to take these animals to a post-mortem. And of the cases that we have had, um, not all of them need to go to post-mortem. Some of them actually, live strandings, are successfully refloated. And over the course of the, uh, the programme, there's been about 420 of those which we haven't taken to post-mortem because that would be somewhat unfair. But of the dead stranded cases, um, which count to uh, 3,300 of them, um, we've managed to take um, only about 17% of those to full necropsy. Now, the reason is, is that in many cases, they're either too decomposed to merit a full-blown diagnostic investigation, um, or it's just simply too difficult to be able to get, to get them um, recovered from, from areas around the coastline. Um, however, in cases where that, that happens, what we have managed to do, particularly over the last few years with help from the uh, SMAS volunteer network, has been able to collect samples from a further 1,200 of those cases. And therefore, if you sum those together, um, we've basically got about 3,500 cases that have been examined um, in some way. And a cause of death was re reached in 85% of those cases. So that was either because we were able to diagnose them directly from photographs or images, um, which we uh, were confident that we knew what had happened based on external examination, or we were able to take them to necropsy and um, build the cause of death um, based on, on the investigations that we did there. So the harbour porpoise, as I said at the beginning, is by far the most numerous cetacean that we have had um, in our um, strandings database. And we have just over 950 of these uh, animals that we've managed to diagnose a cause of death from, either from um, photographs or in most cases through necropsy examination. And when I gave this talk in the, in the forum, um, there was an opportunity for a bit of audience participation here to try and establish what people thought was the um, top three causes of death, with the top one being the most significant and making up just under a third of cases. So 31% of cases um, were this one particular cause of death, and then 10% made up the next two common ones. So if you want to have a brief thought about what we think about what it could possibly be, then we should be able to show this in the next slide. So this is it. Um, just under a third, 31% of uh, harbour porpoises um, are diagnosed as having been victims of bottlenose dolphin attack. And um, this now famous video, which has been shown many times, um, is a good example of, uh, of what and how uh, bottlenose dolphins can target these, these species. Um, after this, starvation hypothermia is makes about 10% and parasitic pneumonia makes up again about 10%. But the, uh, the thing that was sort of interesting is, is that the, the bottlenose dolphin attack was, of course, um, uh, first diagnosed by um, Harry Ross and Ben Wilson, who um, were involved with the scheme right at the very start in the early 1990s. And it was certainly not seen as being um, the most obvious or the most common. In fact, I think quite a lot of people um, thought that it couldn't possibly be the marks that were being seen on harbour porpoise couldn't possibly be from um, bottlenose dolphins because they were just too nice and too friendly and wouldn't possibly do this. But um, it turns out very much not. And uh, as I say, nearly um, a third of cases are bottlenose dolphin attack. Um, the graph at the bottom here is, is sort of curious. It shows the slight uh, decrease of bottlenose dolphin incidents over time. And the map um, up in the top right hand corner shows the uh, the distribution and there's a clear focus in the East Scotland and Moray Firth um, where the, most of these cases are. But we've also found in, in recent years cases dotting up um, all around the, the West Coast and actually now in the rest of the UK as well. So moving on to Mr. Seats. Um, Again, a small bit of audience participation is the top three causes of death for for fin whales, say whales, humpback whales, and minke whales. And we've got a sample size here of about a hundred animals that we've uh, we've managed to look at. And there's a clear winner, if you can call it that, 
um, of the, the top causes of death of these species that makes up 63% of cases is number A. Um, and I'll make it slightly easier. Um, live stranding and ship strike are the, the next two, making up 15% and 3% respectively. So what is A? This is A. This is entanglement. Um, and I have to say, this is one of the, the grimmest and um, most sort of heart rendering um, types of um, trauma that we do see um, as part of the scheme. Um, some of these animals have clearly been suffering for a huge amount of time. Um, and you can see from this uh, rather grim set of photos here um, that uh, in some cases it can cause quite horrific and long term chronic tissue damage. Um, it's not all from fishing gear. Um, some of it is marine debris. Um, some of it is is um, from um, plastic straps and whatever, but the majority of it does seem to be um, from ropes and discarding parts of fishing gear. Um, and actually, um, quite a lot of it seems to be related to entanglement in ropes from the creel industry. And this was such a problem that it was actually part of a piece of work that the um, Scottish Marine Animal Stranding Scheme SMAS were involved with over the last two or three years, um, which was to try and address the issue of marine animal entanglements that were um, were being seen because as you can see from this plot at the bottom here, um, again, over the last sort of um, uh, six to seven years, the number of um, marine animal entanglements has been um, going up. Um, and we also think that there is a significant underreporting of these cases. There was some work done as part of um, the Sea Project, which I'll explain about in a moment, which um, found that over 95% of entanglement cases probably do not go um, reported. So this is the Scottish Entanglement Alliance. Um, it was a consortium that was brought together um, at the behest of the Scottish Creel Fishing Federation, SCFF, who went to Nature Scott a few years ago and actually asked if it was possible to have some research um, done to understand the extent and the severity of entanglement in, in the Scottish uh, Creel fish, uh, Scottish Creel um, industry, uh, because the number of entanglements are increasing and as we said in the previous slide this has implications for both um, animal welfare and also conservation it is possible that some of the these larger species are not recovering at the rate that they should be doing post whaling because of the take which is coming from these animals becoming entangled when they come into our waters um, in addition to which the industry was very aware that the number of creels um, that are being put out into our waters is increasing year on year um, it, because the, the, the um, stocks are declining in order to catch the same amount they're having to put more creels out and leave them out there for longer and unfortunately this is relatively unregulated so there's a lot more material out there and therefore the risks are also going up and the industry is also aware that um, aside from the optics of having animals entangled in their in their gear, uh, it was a huge safety issue for the for the fishes involved, um, and causes downtime, loss of gear, etc. So, in combination with that and support from various legislative changes such as the Fisheries Act and the Joint Fisheries Statement, this all came together to pull this program um, into being. And it was the partners are there at the bottom. So it was ourselves. British Divers Marine Life Rescue, HWDT, Hebridean Well and Dolphin Trust, um, Well and Dolphin Conservation, WC, um, and Nature Scott, and of course the, the Field, Field, Scottish Creel Fisheries Federation. And the final report of this is available. You can you can download this um, from the Nature Scott website, um, and it it goes into a lot more detail about what we were able to find, um, and hopefully we'll be able to continue to talk about this in future years as, the, as this work continues and the mitigation is, is um, mitigation programs are developed. Okay, slight change of taxa now. We'll move on to looking at grey and harbour seals and we don't have as many of these 
at necropsy um, as we do cetaceans, but we have just over 430 of these. And if we exclude the shot animals, the most common cause of death of these um, is mixed between starvation, hypothermia. That's often uh, a problem, particularly around about um, autumn, winter time, when um, gracie weaners fail to thrive and fail to thrive, and often the mortality in these animals can be up to 50%. Um, Grey seal predation is a major part of them. That, that again, comes to 17%. And then of the infectious diseases, parasitic pneumonia, verminous pneumonia, which is, is a, can be pretty severe, um, again, is one of the most common infectious diseases that we see in this population. Thankfully, um, touching anything that happens to be wood at the moment, um, we haven't yet had any um, evidence of another focine distemper outbreak and morbidly virus outbreak um, in, in the harbour seal population. However, if we also look at the number of cases which we've been able to diagnose, not just from necropsy, but also those that we've been able to, to, to have photographs for, um, the total, the number sort of goes up to um, just under a thousand cases. And of these, grey, grey seal predation accounts for 71% of the grey seal and about 35% of the harbour seal mortality. Now, that's not representative of all of the causes of death. It just happens to be easier to diagnose. Um, because this is what they look like. Um, they're very, very um, striking and actually quite kind of gruesome images, which um, are, certainly get people's attention uh, when they're walking on the beach. So these do tend to get reported in. And as, if, as you're probably very aware, um, for many years, uh, we also believed that this couldn't possibly be done by grey seals and it must be due to something mechanical because of the straight edge to the wound and the corkscrew lesions that these animals that had. Um, as you can see, it also, it also affects harbour porpoises as well. But, um, but yes, this was, this was definitely a salutary lesson in terms of the information of, uh, of uh, what could potentially be causing this. And it was only, again, through the collaborations of, of the people from the Sea Mammal Research Unit that were able to film an animal being predated on the Isle of May that we were able to join the dots together and realise that these um, seemingly industrial human types of lesions were in actual fact done by a grey seal um, predating, eating um, and uh, obviously killing um, the younger juveniles, harbour seals um, and other, other species. So there's a few examples of cause of death that we've done and what, what causes uh, the animals to strand. But that's not the only thing that the scheme has been trying to do over the last few years. Um, the necropsy findings based on gross pathology, us examining the animal, and histopathology supported by a number of diagnostic tests are of course important. Um, they are one of the main drivers of the scheme and it's to essentially establish um, the reason that the animal died. That is the most important part of it. And for many years that was how what drove the, the scheme. It was not even just to know um, what the cause of death was, but just to find out whether or not it was anthropogenic. So was it effectively bycatch or not. Um, but obviously the, the, the scheme has been able to collect other information from, the, from this. And over the years, we've developed information on a number of other aspects. So we have a good data set on pathogen presence and prevalence, um, which can help us understand more about the disease ecology of these species. Um, from collecting um, age and um, gonadal assessments. Um, so collecting the teeth and looking at the gonads, we've been able to build up some good life profile, life history profiles um, in collaboration with our, our colleagues at the CSIP down in London and colleagues in Ireland and the Netherlands. Um, similarly, by collecting stomach content analysis and looking at the hard parts of those, um, we've been able to 
um, collaborate with groups who have been able to understand feeding ecology and recently that's been augmented by work looking at stable isotope and fatty acid components which is a nice synergy to looking at just the hard parts of the of the stomach because stable isotopes and fatty acids can give you a slightly longer time scale for what the animal's been eating and rather amazingly not only what it's been eating but also where it has been eating as well and finally of course um, the data and tissue samples that we collect from, from NECOPS examinations has built a, a um, rather extensive profile of contaminant burdens in collaboration with our colleagues at the uh, CFAS down in Lowestoft. Um, and I'll explain a little bit about that in a moment. And if you build these all together, all of these for the five components and, and add in sort of the other things that obviously can impact stranding such as considering disturbance, noise, environmental factors. These are much harder to be able to pick up at pathology because they don't often leave a pathological legacy. But if you combine these all together, then you're able to be able to not just understand why the animal died, but also, um, sorry, not understand how the animal died, but also the why of what was the the health of this animal. Um, so we've got a more uh, detailed information about the individual health and condition of these of these animals. Um, and that is useful in terms of assessing their their resilience to uh, environmental stresses in the round. So in other words, the cause of death is is the basics that's good we need to do this it's kind of it's, it's the basic building blocks on which all of this this um, develops um, assessing the the health metrics of the individual um, is useful as well because it enables us to rule things in and out so we can identify the potential stresses which are impacting health and also be able to say those which are not and that's important because it's, some, it's important to disentangle the cause and effect relationships in these cases, which is actually quite difficult. An example being, is an animal thin because it's ill or is it ill because it's thin? However, if we do this on enough cases, as represented by those different coloured porpoises there, then we begin to develop a set of, of data and information that can be used to inform on population and ecosystem health. And that's the direction that we think the, the project will be going in future. This is about integrating the information from all of these sources together to be able to understand trends over time and space, and ideally to try and identify what are the best indicators that we can use to assess population health. And I guess of all the cumulative effects that we're trying to understand, then the most infamous of those is the effect of contaminants such as persistent organic pollutants, um, of which the most notorious are probably the PCBs, the polychlorinated biphenyls. Now, these are pretty uh, appalling um, contaminants, they're, and they accumulate in fatty tissue such as blubber, so they're particularly um, they have particular impact in cetaceans and, and seals uh, that have high lipid reserves. Um, they can also disperse great distances through the air and the water and once they get into mammalian physiology they can have impacts um, uh, in terms of disrupting um, physiology, physiological processes such as immunity and reproduction. They bioaccumulate and then bioamplify up through the food webs. And the bits of tissue that we've been collecting from, from animals over the last three decades have been analysed, so most of them have been analysed by CFAS. Um, and in collaboration with um, our sister organisation, the CSIP down in London, um, we now have one of the world's largest data sets on uh, chemical pollution to exposure in cetaceans. Um, and you can see from this cartoon here that, th that this is the problem, is, is that the contaminants as they get into the water, they, um, they build up through the uh, phytoplankton, zooplankton and into the smaller fish and bigger fish and seals and then it's the um, apex predators, the marine mammals, particularly the killer whales as an example, um, which has see the effect most, most acutely. And in terms of the contaminant burden in killer whales, um, this is a slide I suspect several of you have seen uh, a few times before. This shows the levels of uh, PCB pollution, the sum of 25 congeners, all the different types of PCBs that we, we, we look for 
in uh, the blubber taken from killer whales that have stranded around northern Scotland from Orkney and also the Hebrides. Um, and the line that's just about to bounce in here, this is the level above which we see physiological harm of some nature. So this is above that line. Um, we expect that the levels of um, PCB contamination will be having some effect in terms of their reproduction and their immunity. And you can see from this, it, it's quite stark that um, all of the uh, animals, both males and females, um, from both the Northern Scotland and Orkney population and particularly the Hebrides population have levels of PCB that are well above that safe threshold. And the most extreme example of this was, of course, Lulu, one of the um, uh, older females from the West Coast community who stranded in Tyree a few years ago. And when we analysed her blubber levels, we found that she had over 100 times the minimum toxic dose. So she had um, 957 milligrams per kilo um, of PCB um, in her blubber. And that was obviously likely to be having a number of different effects, which I don't have time to go into here, but I think okay, in terms of reproduction and, Im and immunity. But as I say, one of the values has been to look at this data over um, a longer period of time and a number of different species. And this is some work that Rosie Williams um, is in the process of, of just publishing. Um, and it's a, a slightly complicated slide, but um, if you bear with me, I'll, I'll try and talk, uh, talk you through it. If we just consider the map on the left hand side, this shows um, each different color um, is a different species and the size of the circle represents the magnitude of the contaminant burden, the PCB contaminant burden. And the very large green uh, splodges you can see around the West Niles are, of course, from the killer whale populations with exceedingly high levels. But you can see there are also um, relatively large um, burdens, particularly in things such as bottlenose dolphins um, around the entire coast of the UK, um, particularly around London and down in the southwest coast. However, if we look over at the, the, the panel plots on the right hand side, um, again, each one of the different panel plots is a different species. Um, and this shows the general trend of pollution burden over time. And the main take home from this is, is that all of these levels are decreasing, which is excellent. The numbers are going down. The problem is, is they're not going down quickly enough in order to make sure that the numbers of these, that the proportion of these animals that are not being exposed is, is actually decreasing. And in context for this, Europe produced around about half a million tonnes of PCBs over the last um, 60 to 70 years. Um, and they were banned in the 1980s. And, and this is why the levels in many marine animal species, including cetaceans, are going down and are stabilising um, over Europe. And we're seeing this also in, over the Arctic. But the problem is, is that once these contaminants um, get into the marine environment, they are difficult, if not impossible, to remove. And as we've been talking about, they accumulate through food webs, they can persist over time. And particularly in, in apex predators such as killer whales, um, which can live for many decades and feed right at the top of the food chain, they are particularly susceptible to their, their effects. And the stockpiles, uh, there are many stockpiles that exist throughout Europe, and it's kind of a, really on us, it's our onus. Um, we should try and best we can to lobby governments and ensure that um, these toxic burdens do not get into the marine environments. They are incredibly difficult to mitigate um, and because they were used in such a wide range of materials and they have this sort of long-term environmental persistence, they're actually really difficult to render safe. They're not impossible, but it is not, it's not straightforward. But the sort of work that Rosie's demonstrated here, by gaining a, a better understanding of these pathways and understanding the, the trends over time for, for how these, these pollutants are behaving in, in the marine mammal populations, um, we can begin to sort of understand how, what the general threats and pressures are on on these populations in the round. Um, and it's particularly um, important for understanding how the PCB burden impacts other threats and pressures that these populations have. And this is particularly evident, for example, in the West Coast population, which exhibits it, um, both chemical pollution and in Lulu's case, also high levels of entanglement.
So I'm going to wrap it up here. Um, and whilst I'm just trying to pull this all together, um, here is a lovely picture of a sperm whale that's stranded out in Luskantar Beach on Harris. And um, just to demonstrate that, um, although it's a slightly odd job that we're all involved with, um, it does actually take us to some quite remarkable places and allow us to um, understand and work with some quite astonishingly interesting species. Um, but none of the work that's been done and that's been presented and none of the results that we've tried to sort of show, none of this would have been possible without the collaboration and help and assistance from a huge number of different people, researchers, diagnosticians, policy people, people involved with welfare, pathologists, vets, and above all, the volunteers. Um, we say that kind of SMAS is quite a small group. It's only three people that work um, for the project full time, but actually it's huge. It has all of the help of the volunteer network and all of these collaborations that make um, anything that comes out of it um, possible. And I guess what what is next? What are we going to do going forward? Well, um, I mean, ideally, what we're trying to do is to understand the threats and pressures that impact our marine life. OK, I guess, <laughs> because if we do that, we may be able to um, come up with some clever and hopefully effective mitigation for them or um, because it seems like it's necessary. But understanding the threats and pressures is a complex and really multifaceted issue. Um, and this kind of ranges from understanding the immediate factors that lead to an animal become stranded, uh, such as the, the cause of death that we've been talking about, what was the proximal reason that this animal hit the beach, um, to doing a bit more with the data that we can collect from, from stranding, such as by assessing indicators of health and resilience um, for, for not just assessing how the animal died, but as we say, assessing how it lived as well. And then I guess going forward, what we'd aspire to try and do or have ambition to try and do is to find ways of integrating um, the many multiple and integrated effects that we can see from all the various different stresses that are that are impacting on, on marine life and, and try and work out um, where are the where are the, the easy levers to pull what is what should we be concentrating on? What are the, the most important um, threats and pressures, stresses that are being put on by human activity um, that are amenable to mitigation um, and hopefully providing um, some of the evidence that can be used to, to do that. So I'm going to wrap up here again. Thank you very much to listening to this sort of second version of the talk. I hope it was slightly more clear, um, even if audibly clear, if not in content than the first time around. Um, and um, I think I will wrap up just with a final slide to say thank you very much to all of the people that have been involved with this. So yes, this is our final credit slide. Um, as I say, a huge number of people that over the years have, have provided input, data, samples, help, assistance and diagnostics. So um, thank you to them. Thank you to you. and. Hopefully we will see you again um, in person at the next Marine Forum, probably in February 2024. Take care. Bye bye. Um, my talk, Chris, uh, you need to turn your mic on. Yeah. Or you can have this very popular. Sorry, sorry all. So um, I'm afraid my talk has almost got nothing to do with the title I got. Um, I managed to completely ignore that as I was thinking through. So um, I was told collaboration was the issue. So um, I wanted to talk about collaboration and the concept of agency. And I don't mean um, our distinguished uh, statutory agency folks, of course, they're part of all of this, but I mean, in terms of agency as us as individuals, organizations that have opportunity to try and influence things. Um, and I wanted to say, where does that lead to a successful conservation practice? So I was going to talk about three things, really. So the direct collaboration and agency, things like citizen science. I was going to talk about direct 
collaboration agency in human dolphin mutualism. So this is cooperative behavior between cetaceans and human beings. And there's a few examples around the world that we can have a look at. And I was going to kind of make a, an assertion that there's an indirect collaboration and agency in human dolphin interactions where you're not physically there, but the work that we do through things like citizen science, the work that we do as cooperative agencies for conservation advancement actually has a mutual benefit for all of us. So um, the first part is we're going to just talk a little bit about Shorewatch. And so this is a direct collaboration and the concept of increasing agency in folks to take responsibility and to be able to make differences in their local community. Um, if I talk about Shorewatch, really we started 2005, the Shorewatch program was developed um, very much hand in hand with Nature Scott. If Nature Scott hadn't been around, I'm not sure this program really would have got off the ground, but it was recognized that the relationship between these kind of um, NGOs and the public and statutory agencies is where we can empower each other in terms of delivery. Nature Scotland has its targets that it needs to meet, but as NGOs, we have our ambitions about what we want to see in conservation and the public very much have a belief in that local wanting to protect uh, wildlife, the natural environment around themselves. So connecting all those three together is really important. And to date, I think I'm right, we've had about 85,000 watch effort now onto the database, which is kind of amazing if you think about all the work that's gone on there. So you end up with a time series of cetacean sightings around the Scottish coast, but that's got data on how cetaceans are using the environment, uh, behavior, presence of calves, lots of rich sources of data. And that actually leads to real changes. And I think this is the thing, the last time I uh, was lucky enough to come up to the Marine Forum, uh, I think in Inverness, we, were, we had an industry body representative there who talked about the moving of where they were going to place a cable in the Moray Firth. And that was because of the data that had come through part of the Shorewatch program in that they then took that stance and said, look, we'll be responsible and do something different. But it's also leading to inputs to things like marine protected areas. So all those wet, cold days sat there on a hillside actually can lead to real change out in the wider environment. So Shorewatch really helped shape science as a two-way process. I think for years and years, we've had science is kind of one way where information is collected by academics, it goes back into the literature, and then if we're lucky, policymakers actually pay attention, if we're lucky. What we want to, with Shorewatch and similar programs is that the information also flows back, the consequences of that information and the understanding that you can make a real difference. Because I think that concept of agency doesn't just lie then with the scientists, it lies with us as individuals if we're on the shoreline, if we're on the hilltop, actually wanting to make a difference. And that's the empowering bit, because what I've seen in Shorewatch folk is they tend to become the advocates, both for the local environment and for the the pinnipeds, for cetaceans, everything. Uh, I think some shore watch folk are also into things like plant life and the flora, green stuff that grows on the sides. I mean, it's not wet, but you know, it's still important there. And that's part of the empowering nature of this kind of feeling that what you do as an individual is collectively actually making a real difference. So during, uh, I say the Brexit, I'm not giving away my opinion on the issue of Brexit, but boo. Um, we were told, don't trust the experts, just trust the public. And then during COVID, we were saying, trust the experts and please ignore the public. The reality is we need to trust the experts and we need to trust the public. As I say, it's, it is a group effort in terms of making these, these changes uh, and wanting to see something happen that's gonna be positive. And I wanted to just point out that the information that citizen science actually produces leads to real changes. I can see at least two other people in this room who were at the EFRA committee recently uh, giving evidence in terms of cetacean policy going forward. I think Rob actually was in the science part, put forward some really good uh, representation of citizen science in terms of its importance. And that kind of got, got home to the, well, I hope it's got home to the MPs. We shall see when the report comes out. But things like Shorewatch are being mentioned at that level. It's Westminster, so it's not so important up here, but it's still an important forum in terms of the wider aspects of it. And um, I was at the JNCC joint agencies launch of their pre-CDD program uh, the other day, 
Um, and this concept of the public and the engagement of the public and the public understanding was critical to all of that. Um, I think it would have been even greater if they hadn't locked the rest of us out because it turned out Brian May is in the audience and all the uh, senior folk from all the agencies wanted selfies with him. <laughs> so they locked the doors while they did all their photos. Um, Shortwatch is both the power of Shortwatch and the magic of it is you have individuals and you have collective efforts. Alex here, I think is in Nen, I think. And it looks like she's on her own, but actually she does have a collaborator. <laughs> and in this, this case, somebody very important in terms of sanity. And that's part of the, again, just an illustration of the wonderful nature of these kind of programs. So lessons learned from previous uh, Marine Forum was that we realized that societal action are perceived to have more power than individual action. When there's a group in a community of, say, here in Scotland, of all of you actually representing an issue, that is much more powerful with legislators in going forward. And we also found that increased knowledge means that we prioritize marine conservation in a better way. So it's democratizing, but with people who actually also understand the issue. And that's really critically important because conservation only works if we have that buy-in of local communities as well. It's a cliche, but it's true. So this is a little negative bit. So despite programs like Shorewatch, sometimes the climate and nature crisis can feel overwhelming. This is a, a classic image I think people might have seen before, which is sort of the, the loss of wildland animals. And I think um, various agencies were on radio this morning talking about the UK is in that bottom 10% in terms of everything that we've lost. We, our whole of nature in the UK, we're in the lowest 10% uh, left um, it, as natural habitats. Fish, really, it looks not too bad, but it's only because we can't reach them. We haven't been able to find out how to get to them in the best way, but we're still 14% down there. So there's a, there's, a, there's a little sort of comment that David Attenborough said, so if it's wrong, it's his fault. But he estimated uh, from the work he'd done, how, what was the percentage of human beings and livestock of all the mammals on earth? Do you know what, any guesses what that is? How much of all the mammal biomass do humans and livestock, the animals we raise, account for out of 100%? Any guesses? You're far too clever. This, it's actually 96. So it's 4% of everything else from antelope to zebras make up that 4%. We make up that whole 96%. I think it's something like a bird species, 70% are poultry of all the birds that are left. So despite that, hope comes in many different ways. And here's just a couple of examples in terms of um, human dolphin interaction. Um, Elsa did the thing, and I thought I was going to be quite impressive by saying how many <laughs> contributors were on this paper, but 3,000 beats me. Um, so this was a paper in uh, 22, which was about talking about human wildlife cooperation. And the team there came up with six type of um, definitions. There's a ty typo here, which most probably just betrayed my feeling about human beings at that moment in terms of being kleptoparasites as opposed to kleptoparasitism. And what they were talking about is, how do animal and human inter um, interactions develop in terms of mutualism? How do we cooperate? So from things like mutualism, this is where um, animals interact with humans or animals interact with another animal and nothing happens. So in um, ravens uh, are known to leave wolves, for example, to prey. And then once the wolves have taken the prey, the ravens will feed on what's left over. So to the bottom left, you get the sort of the harder end of it, where we have direct competition. To the top right, in mutualism, we have that kind of positive reaction of interaction. So both animals and humans um, uh, get a benefit out of what we're talking about. And there's various routes towards that. So the type of cooperation we may see now in places like Brazil, I'll show you in a second, um, may not have been the way it started, but that's the way it, it's, it was at the beginning. So the program has looked at a whole series of um, cross-taxa investigations uh, red is no recent records, likely extinct. Yellow is largely or entirely inactive. Blues are active. So you see, we've got Irrawaddy dolphins. We've got um, a subspecies of bottlenose dolphins in Latin South America. And I have a personal, and these are birds, so I'm told I'm not really supposed to talk about them, honey guides in Africa, which are amazing birds, which will lead um, uh, uh, human beings after the humans give a call, and it's not a bird call, it's a human call, 
and the birds will lead them to where the honey is. If you open up the hive, the humans extract the, the honey, the, the birds take the, the wax. And what's incredible is if humans disappear for a period of time and they're not giving the call, it appears that culturally the birds pass on that knowledge to further generations. Then when humans come back and interact, they still recognize the call and they help each other out. Um, in terms of some of the other species, we're talking about, um, in this case, dolphins. So uh, Mauricio Cantor and team been looking at um, Laguna in Brazil. And what they found was cooperative fishing between the dolphins and human beings led to between three and seven times more fish being caught. And what's happening is the dolphins are herding the fish into a certain area, and then the fishermen cast their nets out and they catch them. What's more interesting, I think, even now, is that we're most probably seeing better survival in those dolphins. They're in a smaller range, but also they're finding things like there's different vocalizations in that group. The group that participate in the cooperation, even though they're part of a wider pod, they have different vocalizations. So there's maybe less ascending signals in the in this thing. So there's a cultural defini definition within even within that subgroup. Um, orcas, uh, there's two classic historical cases of orca cooperation with human beings. One was in Chukuka in the east of Russia and Tufal Bay in Australia. Tufal Bay was about 1830. Uh, this is where orcas would identify a, a large baleen whale and bring that whale closer and closer to the hunters, to human hunters. The whalers would then take the whale and then they would take the tongue and give it to the orcas. And it was the tongue that the orcas were after. Uh, that program of cooperation in Australia lasted for a long time. There's about 30 named individuals taking part in that. The only reason why it um, stopped was because people killed them. So it was not the group of whalers that were involved in it. It was others who took part who came in. Um, the Chukaka one, similar, but again, we think it was because someone actually went and killed the animals. Uh, the, the last one is cooperative fishing in Iceland. And this was um, me about 20 years ago. Um, out with the herring fleet south of Iceland and uh, had colleagues on two, two other vessels about 20 kilometers apart. And what the fishermen were doing was following with their sonar where the orcas were. And they found that's where the herring were. So they would put the per seine net out, close the net, and then before fu fully closing it, leave it for about 20 minutes for the fish to fall out the edge. And what the females were doing was bringing in their calves and they were taking the stunned fish that came out of the top of the net. I was talking to the fishermen and saying, so how long have you been doing this? And they said, well, quite a few years. Once the, the orcas had finished and some of the adults would come in and feed, they'd close the net, bring the nets on board. And I said, what was the benefit? And they said, they get about 15% more fish by doing this. Once they'd taken the fish, they went, they said, right, we're going to go find the next group of orcas. And what was happening, the orcas then started moving off. And the fisherman said to me, it's a bit like, this is KFC, then that's Pizza Hut, about five kilometers away. And then we're going off to Burger King over there. But the orcas led the fishermen. And I said to them, this is brilliant. We need to write this up. And they went, please don't. Please don't write this up. Because if this people in Reykjavik know, we will have so much pressure on us in terms of talking about this cooperative behavior. We can't afford to have it. Politics gets in the way of science. Politics gets in the way of uh, um, fishing. Politics gets in the way of conservation sometimes. Um, so I think that we shouldn't really be surprised. We know that walkers and a lot of these creatures have incredible brains, incredible abilities. Um, and it looks like increasingly now in the studies that we have, we have this kind of vertical uh, transmission from mother to calf in terms of the cultural aspects of this learning that's going in place. And this vertical social le learning is in addition to that peer-to-peer -peer learning. And we just don't know yet how embedded that is in that vertical learning. If it goes anywhere near the way the birds are, it might be that something that gets in trained within those dolphins for a long time. Um, I'm going to argue also there's a third type of indirect mutualism, and that's where you have the indirect collaboration between humans and dolphins in terms of wanting to protect them. This is the Murray Firth, which some of you will know. Years ago, and every one of my colleagues will tell you I am the worst person to go whale watching with, okay? I never see whales and dolphins. They never turn up when I'm there. <laughs> they keep giving me hints and I never take them. But the Crown Estates were visiting, the chair of Crown Estates was there and they'd done about seven farms in the, the last day. 
and was absolutely exhausted and got to the Scottish Dolphin Centre and was just feeling, this is amazing. I get to see animals and we were kind of going, going and they were going, the team were going, Chris, can you go and sit at the back? Don't come with us when you go outside because they won't be there. So we went around the ice house. Anyone who's been up there, you see, saw the ice house. As he stepped out, literally, the sun was setting on the horizon, was dropping, and 20 other buggers all turned up and all started leaping just offshore. And he just went, oh, if it's like this every day, this is marvellous. It must be brilliant. Oh, okay. I don't know if they knew. Um, of course, they didn't know. But they did their act. And there was sort of that beneficial relationship between the Crown Estates then realising this is something that's worth continuing to support as we go forward. So we were really pleased. And I was very grateful for them. So toward, this is towards the end of this. This is the other bit about where cetaceans are really playing another role. We now are beginning to understand that really they're incredible ecosystem engineers. We knew that carbon was being fixated in the ocean. We knew that the ocean was playing this huge role for us, but we just didn't know what role cetaceans were playing. And it's a journey we're still on in terms of trying to discover. But we know that, for example, at the moment in the Southern Hemisphere, blue whales transmit about 88 tons of nitrogen per year to their carving grounds. Prior to commercial whaling, that was 24,000 tons. So you imagine the amount of nutrients that are not moving at the moment compared to what it was. We know that uh, sperm whale populations were back to pre whaling levels. You get about another 2 million tons of carbon being removed every year from the atmosphere. And if we think about how important the ocean is, it turns out whales, dolphins have been our allies for years and years. We didn't realize we were treating them badly, but actually, they were producing all these services and can still produce these services if we give them the opportunity to recover and revive. Even when whales die, they are providing services back down at the bottom of the ocean. And I think there's been an estimate that after death, uh, whales are basically feeding about over 200 species. There's a big project hopefully planned um, off the US coast at one stage uh, soon where they're going to sink a, a, a grey whale, a grey whale that's naturally died, and then put 4K cameras on it and watch basically for several years to see what happens. Um, I think the guys who are wanting to do it have even promised to potentially name uh, new life forms if they discover them off. People would like donations, but we'll, we'll see as we go forward. And these guys also, when they're dropping at the moment, Whales take about 145,000 tons of carbon down to the deep sea floor. And that's really where we get sequestration. Coastal, it's a bit more tricky, but down in the deep muds, you can lock things away for thousands of years. So there is a world of hope in this. And it's been estimated that nature-based solutions to the targets we have for 2050 will contribute something like 37% of all CO2 removals we need to make. So we have to change behavior, but also nature is going to play that role. And in terms of the marine environment, we're talking about 21% of all of the total greenhouse gas emissions uh, impacts will be, could be achieved. And therefore, it's why we need to protect these guys and why we need to protect the ocean. These are the last couple of slides, and there's not much for me more to say, but I'm putting them up because I think they are just incredible animals and worthy of us um, looking at. Um, and I guess the secret is, we have cooperation through things like uh, Shorewatch, where academia works with the public, works with NGOs, work with statutory agencies, work with government. We have those cooperations which are direct, where animals are interacting directly with us. And then we have that power of agency to make real differences wherever we're from, whatever is our daytime job, what we can do at the weekend, what we can do in the evening. These guys will benefit more because of you folk and your impact will be long lasting in terms of what we will do going forward. So that's a thank you. I'm Lewis McKenzie and I gather sugar kelp for the Isle of Harris June. We're at Kyo's Pier here um, on the banks of Loch Eresort. Sugar kelp is one of the cold water seaweeds that lives around the coastline of the Outer Hebrides. It is a seasonal seaweed where you get a growth spurt, particularly in the spring and into early summer. It is a key seaweed for sustaining a whole host of uh, crustaceans and marine life uh, because of the huge size of the leaf, which can grow to up to three meters long 
and about a metre across. So it's quite a unique seaweed because it's full of mannitol sugar and also has a very high level of iodine. I free dive for the seaweed, preferably at low tide uh, when there's less water to dive through. The leaf is cut just above the stem so the stem and the plant regrows. The leaves then go into mesh bags and into the boat, comes ashore at Kios and then off to the factory for drying. I think the sugar kelp gives it that maritime edge. It brings that kind of salty sweetness to the gin. And you can actually, if you taste the raw sugar kelp, first of all, you can still pick it up in the gin. So it does certainly add to the product. There's no doubt about it. Now that spring's here, we've got a whole host of migrant birds arriving. So we've got common terns, arctic skuas, they're due to arrive any day. Just out the lock here we now have two pairs of white-tailed eagles, both of which are incubating eggs this week, so that's great to see. The common seals are having their pups at the moment, so you know a whole host of wildlife. Otters are on the move, uh, we're just waiting for the first of the summer mackerel to come, so tasty treats for summer visitors. It's a real melting pot of wildlife arriving from all over the world and they're all busy trying to raise youngsters. The gin is a great product. The marketing of it is fantastic. The bottle looks great. It's a real hit with visitors. It's, it's Harris in a bottle. So yeah, my name is Bethan. Um, I collaborated with both uh, WC and SMAT to explore whether there were hotspot areas indica indicative of carbon grounds around Scotland. Um, so for my talk, I'm just going to go over my study briefly and then I'll just discuss like the benefits of using carbon data and the challenges that I face. So a little bit of background information about the study site and species. So the harbour porpoise, as we mentioned previously, it's the smallest and most common cetacean species um, in UK waters. Um, typically found within shallow waters over the continental shelf, and the mothers have been found to segregate themselves with their young from the rest of the population. Uh, their young usually stay with them for about eight to 12 months after birth. So this really just emphasizes the importance of maternal care for this species um, and the need to protect these segregated sites. Um, in Scotland, so I chose Scotland as a study area because it's consistently raised as an important area for harbour corpus. Um, very common to have harbour corpus stranded along Scotland, and previous research has raised the Sea of Hebrides, the Moray Firth, um, and the Shetland Isles as potential areas where there could be carving. So my overall aim, um, as I've mentioned from the title, was to explore whether there are hotspot areas indicative of carving grounds for harbour corpus around Scotland. I also wanted to explore whether these hotspot areas were moving around Scotland and changing over time. And then I was looking at how these distributions interacted with already existing marine protected areas and what this means for conservation. So this figure here just shows you the current areas of protection around Scotland. So in the purple, you have the special areas of uh, protection with marine components. In the blue, you have the special areas of conservation with marine components in Scotland. In the red, UK offshore MPAs, and in the green, you have MPAs in Scotland. So this is what the figure I was using to compare my results to throughout the study. So the first half of my data um, was strandings collected by SMAS from 1992 to 2020. Um, I used the body length of the stranded individuals as a proxy to determine their age. So looking at previous research into life history, I was able to group them into special age classes. Um, because I was just looking at the carving grounds, I just used the neonates. So this is the newborns, calves, pregnant females, and other. In this other category, it was the individuals that are still of like reproductive importance. So those are stranded and they'd shown recent signs of abortion or recent signs of lactation or recent signs of carving themselves. 
And then for the data analysis, the density and distribution was mapped on QGIS and all statistical analysis was done in R. For the second half of my data, this was observational data collected by volunteers and staff at WDC as part of their short program from 2011 and 2021. Because it was observational data, and as you can imagine, it's hard to spot neonates and newborns, and also it's hard from a distance to tell if an individual is pregnant or not. The sighting data was just made up of those calf individuals. Um, and then to make sure there was consistent effort, all sightings were corrected for the watch effort. So this was the amount of time that the observers were spending on the shore looking for the individuals. And just those calf, uh, the calves sighted um, were from May to November. This was to make up um, the summer skew seen within um, the calving period. And similarly with the strandings, the analysis was mapped on QGIS and done in R. So for the first half of my results, um, the calf strandings, it came back that there was a significant, significant difference between the number of calf strandings between coastal regions. Um, as you can see, the mean number of calves stranded per year on the y-axis against coastal region, the highest rate of calf strandings was in the east. Um, currently, where they were stranding in the east, there actually isn't any protected area, whereas in the Mori Firth, where they're stranding the second highest, this is a significant um, protected area for bottlenose dolphins. So this also raises this area as an important um, important area for harbour porpoises as well as bottlenose dolphins. And then the southeast and southwest were also important for calf strandings. So this figure here is just each map is a seven year period. It's showing you how the distribution of calf strandings has changed over time. And as you can see with the calf strandings, they kind of remain fairly in the same place over time analysis actually came back that they weren't changing over time. For the neonates, um, different regions were raised as an important area. So for the southwest, we had significantly high rates of neonate stranding. Um, and even though there is a small area of protection just south of the Isle of Arran, lots of the Firth, Clyde and southwest, there isn't any protection. Um, but again, the east and the Moray Firth also seem to be an important area where we are finding neonate stranding. Differently this time, with the neonate stranding over time, you can see there's more of a suddenly shift um, between 2006 to 2020. And actually, my analysis came back showing that there was an increase over time in the neonate strandings within the southwest and southeast. So the yellow line is the increase in the southeast region, and the gray is the increase in neonate strandings in the southwest. This is kind of hard to interpret because obviously with strandings, they're deceased individuals. So this doesn't really give us an indication of what is going on, because if the population is increasing and we're having increasing strandings, it could just mean that there's more of them there to strand. Um, but if the population is remaining stable and obviously we're having increasing strandings, this has negative implications. So I just put this figure in here and it just shows you the mean number of strandings for each age category. Um, and it just show, highlights the importance of the Southwest region also for the occurrence of pregnant strandings and the class other strandings. So onto the second half of my results. So this figure is just mapping the shorewatch sites. And as you can see, there's con consistent cover of shorewatch sites across Scotland, apart from just south of the Isle of Mull, this bit here, um, and in the Southwest, there were no shorewatch sites, which is important because as I, just mentioned the southwest seemed to be quite an important area where we're having a lot of these strandings. So there's a little bit of a data gap here. Um, for calf sightings, very different regions were raised compared to the strandings. So we have very high rates of calf sightings in the Outer Hebrides, the North, and the Shetland Isles. Um, the Outer Hebrides, there seems to be a lot of marine protection already, but where they were being sighted in the North and the Shetland Isles, there isn't any protection. This is basically just um, representing that data, but in a more um, density kind of heat map way. Um, but even though it seems like there's very concentrated areas of these sightings, the analysis came back that there wasn't a significant difference in the number of sightings per coastal region. This is probably because of the way I like group my data. So on a small scale, there's more likely, you're more likely to see variation, but because I grouped by a large coastal region like North, East and South, it meant that this variability was kind of lost and this gave my data low statistical accuracy. So the relevance of my results, 
is that both my sightings and surroundings data did show that there were hotspot areas indicative of carbon grounds for harbour porpoise, specifically with high densities in the east, the Moray Firth, um, Sea of Hebrides and the Firth of Clyde. And this is important because it does back up what has been suggested by previous researchers, but also with the Firth of Clyde in the southwest, this area hasn't really been um, raised with much relevance before, so it's important that this area is kind of new and upcoming for neonates and calves. Um, also important implications in terms of conservation, because uh, even though there were a lot of calves and neonates and pregnant individuals occurring within side of these marine protected areas, there was still a lot occurring outside. So this is important for future protection of the species. So yeah, that was my study. Um, and what I found to be beneficial about using both WDC and SMAPS data is that it gave a more complete and wider understanding of what was going on. So if I had just used the strandings data, obviously different regions were raised as important areas compared to the sightings data. Um, so it helps to complete data gaps. So with the shore watch sites missing in the Southwest, if I had collaborated with a further organization or potentially have more sightings within this area, this data gap could have been filled. Um, it reduces the population bias. So by just using stranding data, there's a bias for the more the age and the sex competition composition of the population that is unhealthy. Whereas with sightings, you're more likely to observe the larger and more bold individuals. So having both of them together just kind of minimizes this bias. And by modeling them together, this creates a high statistical accuracy. The only kind of difficult thing about using collaborative data is that obviously two different data sets, there's different survey efforts and different timelines. This means that you're working with different units and can be quite hard for comparative analysis. But in my opinion, I do think it's super beneficial overall to use collaborative data. It means you get a more complete understanding of what is going on with the population and you're more likely to um, withdraw accurate conclusions. Thank you. Um, yeah, so hello again. I'm Nicola and I could talk about rivers all day. I'm sure that it's probably quite bad and not going to, but please, if you get any questions, come and give me a shout afterwards. I'm more than happy to talk about So, as we see, rivers are often benefiting from system science. Are they benefiting? Are they? Why is that big? Ah, there we go. So, rivers are often, I don't know how many of you know the rivers are often or don't, they're an amazing moment. Um, they are unlike a lot of other dolphins with the, the fact that they're just there physically and also what we're finding out is behaviorally wise as well, so the structure is very different. Um, but basically there is no global estimate for rizzles dolphins, so they're currently listed as least concerned. However, the reality is that even the IUCN itself state that this is just a provisional listing because they actually don't know that the populations and the species is not suffering a lot more due to incidental mortality in fishing gear and also some populations hunting. So um, I'm going to give you a figure. The figure is 87, and I just want you to remember that when Katie takes over and starts talking. And 87 is the number of rizzos that have been slaughtered in Taiji within the last three months, just the last three months. So, um, oh, we didn't want that one. Okay. Um, rizzo dolphins again. Again, Looking at it on a global scale, it's not really relevant because we know that with rizzles, they're very discrete populations. So we know, for example, in the Mediterranean, the UK population is completely genetically distanced and discrete from the population in the Mediterranean. And that population has actually just recently been classified as endangered. And the IUCN as well themselves have said potentially is critically endangered because the habitats have been changing, the numbers of the individuals have been reducing. So We've got to think about this in population specific and not looking at it as an, an entire species. So when we do start to look at population estimates, scans is the estimate that we start looking at for populations within the, the European waters. And when it comes to rizzos, there is one um, population estimate of 13 and a half thousand. But it's kind of a bit about the confidence levels are quite different. It can go from 6,000 up to 30,000. But 13 and a half thousand, that's the whole of the EU. So that's not just talking about Scottish waters or English waters, that's just it's the whole of the EU. Um, and there are no specific numbers for the UK 
work at Scotland. And the most important thing is there are no, and there's no information on trends. So we don't know whether they're increasing or decreasing. So that's that's really not very good. Um, the other thing is in the UK, all cetaceans have to have favorable conservation status. That's the legislation, and that's the government is actually responsible for that. However, with Rizzo's and all other cetacean species, conservation status is the unknown. So a bit unacceptable, really. So to this end, we decided back in the 1990s, WDC um, with collaborative effort, collaborative effort. <laughs> Uh, with uh, Sea Watch launched a project in the Outer Hebrides, and they find that the area of the East Coast of Europe is a real hotspot for Rizzo's dolphin with larger numbers than average. So in 2010, uh, WDC decided to go back and we started undertaking land based surveys. We then had Chunkin Head became the shore watching site in 2011, and then we continued every year since going back and taking photo ID studies, uh, acoustic information and then working with shore watchers and with other NGOs like Caribbean Whale and Dolphin Trust, we managed to get the area uh, protected area in 2020. Um, so yeah, so that that's kind of where we are just now. The one thing that we do that we really are able to tell about population changes is through photo ID. Photo ID is, is key. You can tell site fidelity, you can start to tell the social structure, you can talk about behavior. Um, so yeah, photo ID is something which we saw as being the key element that will be able to help us to address potentially population figures and, and the information. So um, I'm going to show you this. This is seaweed. No prizes for getting high for seaweed. Um, and this really is just a bit of a plug to come on to our workshop this afternoon, which will be looking at photo ID. Um, but also the idea was then that we wanted to expand this with Sure watch, uh, which Katie's going to have a talk about just now. Uh, when we expanded that into the Northern Isle, the idea was that we wanted to work with citizen scientists. Um, and probably lots of people have been sending us their photos over the years. And we thought we'll pull these together into catalogues. And also then we can start to understand more of the dolphin distribution, um, habitat use, and their behavioral practices. So um, I'm going to hand over to Katie just now. So it's been a hugely collaborative uh, approach. We've had 1,800 photos sent in to us from a variety of different photographers, including people that just have an interest in wildlife and photography, and then organizations and NGOs that also are working in the region in the field. And we've had these photos sent in to us over a time span of 20 years. Uh, so it's a good amount of time. And yeah, like I said, a hugely collaborative approach. And it's been over 50 individuals that we've had sending photographs to us. And the geographical region that we're looking at, we've separated our catalogue into two. Well, we've got two catalogues and it's separated into the two different regions. Uh, so we've got our first catalogue is Shetland and Fair Isles. And our second catalogue encompasses Orkney, the north, uh, the north of the northeast of Scotland, so Caithness and Sutherland, and then down to the Murray Firth coast and the Aberdeenshire coast. In our Shetland catalogue, we've got 47 individuals. And in our Orkney and northeast catalogue, we've got 112. So that brings me back to what Nicola was saying about the number of individuals that have been wiped out with 87. So that's that's almost half of, of these individuals that we've got here. So and that's just in three months. So that can wipe out an entire region of individuals. Um, and so when we've been looking at our data, we can see that mo already most of our sightings of our catalogued individuals have been seen around the east coast of Shetland and then the south coast of Orkney and or north uh, Caithness and Sutherland, and then around the Murray Firth and the Aberdeenshire coast as well. And so let's have a look at some of our individual dolphins that we have catalogued. So meet Arrow. So Arrow was first seen in 2014. And you can see by the dorsal fin of Arrow, there's a really distinctive marking there, which allows for easy re, re, reciting and remarking, re-cataloging. Um, so seen in 2014 by Colin Bird at Strathy Point. And then again in 2016 and 2018, again in Straffy Point, so we're already seeing that this dolphin likes to hang out in Straffy, uh, was photographed by Karen Monroe. 
And you can see now on these pictures, the top picture is the left-hand side of the dorsal fin, if I've got my left and right correct, and the bottom is, uh, is the right side. So we can now um, catalogue that in individual from both sides of photographs that we get of the dorsal fin. We saw Arrow again in 2018 for Richard Bailey and Chloe Robinson at John O'Groats. And this was actually part of Orca Week, uh, where everybody was hoping to see some orca, and I was there too, and we spotted Rizzo dolphins, but I think Rizzo dolphins are just as cool as orcas. So it was really exciting to see these guys. And we got to catalogue Arrow again. Um, and you can see this picture is slightly poorer quality than the other images that we just looked at. But because Arrow has such a distinct dorsal fin, we can re-sight him time and time again for them. Uh, and then we've got Arrow in 2020, was the last time we've seen Arrow. So over a six year period, we've been recording Arrow. Again, seen by Karen Monroe and Colin Bird, again, around that Caithness Sutherland area in Holborn Head and Leibster at different um, occasions. And again, we've got the right side and the left side. And you can see that top picture is from Karen Monroe, and we've now seen a new scar on the dorsal fin. So we can um, now accurately recite that animal using that photograph. If you're not aware of the, if you're not aware of the regional uh, area that we're seeing Arrow, we first saw him Strathy, then move across to John Groats, then back to Strathy, and then popped our little moving Rizzo. Moving all the way around the coast down at 2020, uh, seeing in, in live stuff. And let's meet a couple other dolphins. This is really exciting. We've got Grove and Aiken that were first spotted in live in 2010 by Colin Bird. And at this point, we didn't actually add it into our catalogue because they didn't have a hugely distinctive dorsal fin. But then when looking at our Shetland catalogue and looking at the photos there, we spotted Aiken and Grove again, uh, four years later and at least 200 kilometres away from where we first saw them. And both times we saw them together with a calf. And I'm already going to go over time, so I'll wrap up quickly. Um, and so, again, talking about what Nicola was saying, we can start using photo ID to understand how far these animals are going, where particular hotspots are, and also some social structure and uh, so individual associations that these animals are creating, making. And just to wrap up really quickly, a beautiful picture of a calf and mother from Hugh Harrop in Shetland. Again, just showing that with photo ID, we can look at um, carving areas as well and really pinpoint areas of importance for these uh, uh, dolphins. Um, and which brings me on to the fact that we ha have got a publication in press at the moment. Again, a hugely collaborative approach, working with lots of different organizations and the photographers um, on our paper. And we'd like to say a massive thank you to our photographers that have sent photos in and the groups that we've worked with. And as a team, we will be doing a workshop later. Uh, so please come and ask us any more questions and actually have a look at our catalogues in, um, in the flesh. Thank you very much. Okay, so my talk is entitled How Do We Not Know That Yet? And really, that is a bit of a, my fascination with Mickey Wales, um, but also my frustration with our understanding of Mickey Wales so far. And I'd like to give you just a little bit of an example. Uh, and whilst doing this, I want you to bear in mind that Mickey Wales grow up to lengths of 10 meters. And Whilst I was having this talk, I was wondering how I would scale exactly what 10 meters looks like, but the organizers so very up which prevents me from having to get down on the floor and uh, give me a scale that way. So thank you very much. Um, yeah, bearing in mind that they're a 10 meter marine mammal, uh, we don't really know where they come from or where it is that they go when they leave the UK waters. Um, and we know this for lots of fish species and eel species, and even tiny little brown birds. But when it comes to a uh, 10 metre mammal, <laughs> we have literally no idea. And to me, that's really quite bizarre. So that's really my fascination and, and kind of what drew me to, to meet the whales. Um, on screen, I've got my uh, fantastic supervisory team. Uh, and whilst they've all offered me, a lot of invaluable input. Uh, I'd really like to thank Denise and Ben, particularly because um, 
they're the ones that have to put up with me most frequently. <laughs> and uh, they're the ones that have to drag me back from running down another rabbit hole. And um, so thank you to them. Uh, Mariel asked me to, to speak here today for two reasons. Uh, the first, and I quote, is is midwell are quite hot right now. <laughs> um, and as a midwell researcher, I, I'm, I'm inclined to, to disagree with her on that one because I think they're, they're hot all the time. Um, but I certainly agree on the second point, and that is that without collaboration and input from an awful lot of organizations, uh, this project absolutely could not go ahead. And I really want to highlight that by getting all the, all the logos. Um, of all the people that have provided data for this project. And, and if you look at the organizations on the screen, I'd go as far as to say that I think a lot of people in this room, if not everybody in this room, has uh, provided data to one of these data sets. So I'd like to start this presentation and perhaps a bit of an orthodox way and ask you to give yourself and everyone else in the room a round of applause. So, <laughs> Okay, so my research really is all about moving to Wales on the West Coast and trying to add information for this uh, new CFW's MDA. So what is it that we, we need to know when we're talking about conserving species? Well, really, we need to know where they are and where the threats are. Uh, then we need to know when they're there and when they're in the area. Uh, for a species like native whales that are in Scottish waters to forage, we need to know what it is they're eating. And finally, we need to understand a bit about the population structure. So do we just have males? Do we just have females, juveniles, or have we got a nice mix? And today, just for some time restrictions, I'm going to be sticking to the, to the where question. Um, and i just like to carry out this process in this is probably quite an oversimplification of, of the conservation kind of journey. Um, and that with each of these species, there's about a million sub-questions that keep me lying awake at kind of three, four in the morning. Um, so where are Mickey whales? Uh, well, to answer this this question, I've got an amazing data set from the Hebridean Whale and Dolphin Trust, um, and it stretches from 2002 to 2019, and it's got more than 100,000 kilometers of survey effort, which, to put into perspective, is like them sailing around the world two and a half times. Uh, and you can see, kind of on the right hand side of this slide, just just how well they've surveyed this area in the last 20 years, and to top that off. They, they've got close to a thousand Mickey Whale sightings. But as superhero esque as HWDTR, they can't be <laughs> everywhere at once. Our was so there is up here in the midge, uh, our Mickey Whales may well be down in the south. And so, what we have to do is run this as a mathematical model. Now, in my experience, when I say the term mathematical model or species distribution model, or habitat suitability model, uh, one of two things seems to happen. Either half the room just glazes over, <laughs> or the other half the room kind of tends to go into a bit of an internal frenzy of the panic. <laughs> uh, but I'm going to let you into a little bit of a secret today, and that is that actually these models uh, are really quite simple in their, in their components. There's only three components. The first is to understand the conditions where the mink whales are. The second is to understand the conditions where the whales aren't. And the third is to match steps one and two to the conditions of our survey area. So in our case, that is the West Coast. So how do we do that? What do I mean by this? Well, when we have our whales, we can note down things like the, the depth, the slope, and, and things like sea surface temperature. And then we can do that for areas where we don't have big whales as well. And if we do this enough times, then we can get a good idea of the depths that the mink whales uh, tend to be found in, and also the depths that seem less suitable for them. And over time, if we do this enough, we can get a pretty good idea of their range, and also kind of the, and you see that we, we always get these kind of weirdos at either side, <laughs> like if it's deeper, like if it's shallower, but generally we get a good idea of the range, and also the range that aren't suitable. So if we do this for enough of our variables, then we've got our mathematical model. So we've backed up steps one and two. Now, if we take a look at step three, we need to match these conditions across the area of interest, again, the West Coast. And on this slide, you can see how these, these kind of variables change. So you can see we've got the depth, the distance from the coast, and our slope here. 
with our garden values showing sort of the more extreme values. But this is a bit of an oversimplification because whilst things like depth will stay constant in an area, uh, we also have variables like temperature, which are going to be changing all the time. And you can see just from this little animation um, how, how much this changes throughout the West case. But really, the principle is the same. We stick to what conditions it is that the meat wheels are in. So once we do this, we can begin to get an idea of how our whales might be moving throughout Scottish water season. And I want to stress really clearly that this is a, a very first iteration of the model. So it's, it's going to change quite a lot over the next few months. Um, but already we can get an idea of how meat whales might move from the, the southwest and up to the northeast throughout the season. And this kind of supports work that's been done on a smaller scale before. Um, by Kelly McLeod et al. and Pierre Underworld et al. Um, and it's also kind of supported uh, largely by the acoustic data that we have as well. So what's next? Well, I've already alluded that we, we haven't quite finished the where question, um, <laughs> but we'd really like to take that, and once we've got the completed model, look at where the threats are and how they overlap so we can get a better understanding of exactly where the high risk areas are. Uh, then to answer the, the way question, we have a lovely array of uh, data from, from hydrophones or underwater microphones uh, that stretches right along the west coast and down to Ireland. Um, and we're currently working with colleagues from NOAA and uh, from the Lighthouse over at Aberdeen uh, on a classifier which will uh, automatically detect these, these big well calls. Because as you can imagine, we've got days and days and days and days of, of data that would be impossible to go through even with sort of 10 researchers working on it constantly. Um, and once we've done that, we'll be able to understand this this, this when question a, a lot better because we'll have a, a good idea of exactly which of these stations they're at and when throughout the year and also throughout the day. Then finally, on to the last two questions, and this is really where the SMAS data is going to come in super useful. And the, what are they eating? Well, we can just dive into the, the stomach samples that SMAS have taken and we can find exactly what it is that they've been eating. Uh, and also the, the records that they've been taking um, uh, are, are really kind of invaluable for understanding the population structure uh, that we have. Uh, because it also gives us information on sex, which we can't get in any non-invasive way in the field, really. Um, and also gets to understand the, the age category from the of measurements that they take. So that's going to be hugely useful going forward. Uh, I just want to finish by saying thank you very much for listening, um, and thank you again to everybody that's uh, contributed data to this project. Couldn't happen without you. So thanks. Well, we'll start um, with a very big shout out to all the Shorewatch volunteers, because that shout out from the minister was about this project that I'm going to show you about now. And none of this would have happened without WDC Shorewatch. So this is a very big thank you to every single person in this room and online who's helped collect data and been involved with this project. Um, like Chris was saying earlier, this is work that gets noticed by the government and that's important and that contributing to policy and change and protecting all the species that we're here to hear about and that we love. So yeah, really excited to share with you what we've been up to, watching from all the shores around Scotland. But yeah, big thank you to all. This is our data. This is not just my PhD whatsoever. So I'm going to talk to you about the Scottish Vessel Project, if you've not heard of it before. So it's a project between Harriet Watt University WDC, Shorewatch, and a whole heap of collaborators as well who've been collecting vessel data and all sorts of different types of data. So I'm just going to talk you through it and show you some preliminary results so far. So the kind of hook or the reason why I got really interested in vessel data is because we don't have much data about it all and the data that we do have is pretty rubbish. So I'm really interested in looking at impacts to marine mammals and especially in mapping those out and figuring out where are the areas that we need to conserve and protect a little bit more, uh, where are the areas where there's lots of activity going on. But the problem with vessel data is there's not many types of vessel data that you can use and a lot of it's very gappy. So the main and most frequently used type of 
uh, data, vessel data globally is AIS data. So this stands for Automatic Identification System. So this is legally required for fishing vessels over 50 meters long, uh, commercial vessels, vessels carrying a certain number of passengers, um, if you're a ferry, if you're a tanker, all those kinds of things legally transmit information about where they are, their identity, what they're doing, what bearing they're heading on, what speed they're going at. So when it comes to mapping where the pressure is from them, that's quite simple, just use the AIS data. But what about all the vessels that legally don't have to transmit any information on where they are? These are all missing from AIS data sets and from most other vessel data sets too. So things like speed boats, yachts, jet skis, um, smaller fishing boats, so creel boats tend to be under 15 meters, I won't legally have to transmit AIS either. So how do we map out where that stuff is and where those impacts are occurring from those vessels? And then there's a gray area even further um, with things like military vessels, which are allowed to switch their AIS off while they're doing exercises. There's some uh, smaller fishing boats who will put an AIS box on the boat through good practice for safety um, and same for other small vessels. So there's just a lot of gray area about what is out in our seas and what's doing an impact to our marine mammals. So to try and answer this question, um, the Scottish Vessel Project is collecting data in a variety of ways. So the first way is collecting AIS data in the first place. So in Scotland, um, this you have to collect it yourself basically or pay thousands of pounds worth of money to buy AIS data from companies like Marine Traffic or Fleetmon. So uh, we've been working with Fleetmon to deploy a whole heap of AIS receivers at sites all around Scotland to collect information on these larger vessels. So you can see we've got quite a good coverage um, of the coast around Scotland. There's some folks in this room that have got them up at the house and at the work. So a big thank you to you guys as well. Um, we've still got some gaps in the data you can see on the map on the west coast around the Hebrides and the sky, so please do give me a shout if you'd like to have one. Um, so along with the AIS data, we're also doing the land-based watches. So this is where you shore watches come in and the Ugly Marine Mammal Research Initiative. So we've got these vessel watching sheets, which you do additional to your 10 minute shore watch. So your dedicated vessel watch sheets is just your sheet for your vessels where you record what time the vessel comes in and out of view, what it's doing, its behavior, its activity, and um, whether or not you see it at the same time as marine mammals. And if you do, was there an interaction or did the behavior change? So the next type of data is using time-lapse cameras. So we've deployed a few cameras at a few different sites around Scotland, which take a picture every 30 seconds. So the idea with the time-lapse camera footage and with the land-based watch data is to look at what was actually there. The shore watch data and the camera data shows us what was actually there. And then we compare that to the AIS data and figure out what was missing. So if we just mapped only using AIS data, how many vessels and what types of vessels would be missing? So this has been going on for about 14 months now. We're still gonna be collecting data till at least the end of next summer. So we're kind of halfway through, but I can today kind of show you a bit of an indication of what we can pull out of the data, what we're finding so far. So you can see there's been an incredible amount of effort so far in the past 14 months. Um, we can see over a hundred watches at like the main study sites that we've kind of picked up people doing efforts. So in the Firth of Forth, in the Murray Firth and in Shetland, this is really nice because we can compare um, how vessels are behaving at different sites around Scotland and also have a look at the different types of marine mammals that we're seeing at different sites around Scotland. Um, so you can also see there's a huge amount of minutes effort watching altogether, almost 40,000 minutes of effort. So yes, big thank you to all of you in the room that have contributed to this and all those online. I'm super grateful and excited to show you what we've found so far. So the first thing that I begin to pull out and have a look at is the proportion of AIS versus non-AIS vessels. So the different colours are the different study sites that I just showed you in the map. So there's the Firth of Forth, the Murray Firth and Shetland. And then up the side is the percentage of vessels that weren't AIS vessels. So they were not transmitting their activity. So basically translate this graph as that percentage. So over here, let's see if I can point. That 67% of the vessels seen on average in February in Shetland 
we're not transmitting AIS. Um, so that means that the map was 67% wrong according to our data. So you can see that in some months, things are quite similar. Uh, in April, all the sites, in November, everything's quite similar, but there's other months where there's quite a difference. Um, so you can see that we are having some differences across sites that we're focusing on. But overall, the average kind of sits at around, let's have a look at this percentage, it's around 48% year round across all the different sites, the average number of vessels not transmitting AIS. And the important thing to take from this too is that this never gets down to zero. So that means AIS data is never accurate. So it means our, all our vessel data that we use for things like collision risk, for modeling underwater noise from vessels, for any of those um, uh, impacts where we're saying how risky things are to marine mammals, we're only using this data. And all this effort from Shorewatch has showed us that it's 48% wrong. We're maybe underestimating risk by a huge amount. So yeah, big implications for what we're, we're finding from Shorewatch. So big thank you again. But now onto the marine mammal, but the bit that we're all here for, not the vessel stuff. So we've also been recording how many times we see marine mammals at the same time as vessels and whether there's or not there's been any interactions and if it has, what type of interactions were they? So um, you can see I split it up again by study sites. And then, so we've got a little donut for each study site. So this is the percent of vessel watches with no marine mammal sightings. So this is the amount of times percentages proportional for each site that we've stood out and just seen vessels and not seen any marine mammals. So there's only been vessels out there at sea. So quite, quite a regular occurrence in Shetland and in the Firth of Forth to do a watch and not see any marine mammals. It seems like you see them lots more in the Murray Firth. Now the donut shows the percent of time vessel watches that where we saw marine mammals, but there was no interaction. So maybe the marine mammals were really far away, or maybe they were close, but the marine mammals' behavior didn't change, or there was no interaction. So you can see that we're seeing marine mammals quite regularly in the first and fourth in Shetland without an interaction, and the same for Murray for about a third of the time. And then this bit is the bit that's, I guess, important for thinking about implications for marine mammals. This is the percent of vessel watches with marine mammals where there was an interaction. So this is maybe they went to bow ride, maybe they went to, um, maybe the boat went to them and the behavior changed in some way. So these are the ones where the behavior is changing because of the vessels. So you can see one in five vessel watches that's done in the Murray Firth has some type of interaction with vessels and marine mammals. So this is really quite different to up in Shetland and in the first of fourth where an interaction um, rates are much lower. So what we can take from this is that perhaps we need to focus some effort, some time in working more in the Murray Firth on about behavior, behavior around marine mammals in boats. I know there's already a lot of work on it there already, but this just adds to, to the weight of evidence that this needs to carry on going. Um, so, like I said, we're still collecting data until the end of next summer, at least. So if this is a spot to your interest, if you're already trained in short or you'd like to, um, all of the training videos to do that extra seat for your dedicated vessel watches are available online. Um, there's videos where you can watch how to do it, or you can grab me and we can organize a training session to do one. Um, you can grab me anytime or drop me an email if we miss each other today. But yeah, we would love to have more folks on board. We'd love to get a bit more coverage around the West Coast um, or, or even just increase effort in the sites that we're already working on. So yeah, please um, get in touch if you'd like to be involved. Um, yeah, so I'll finish with an absolutely ginormous thank you to everyone here. So grateful. Um, awesome. So, hello everyone. My name is Virginia and I've been tasked with a bit of an effort today and give you a presentation about our recent and current work at the Light Hospital Station. And I really want to start by introducing the team I'm part of, because uh, all the work I'm going to present you to do it today wouldn't be possible uh, for each one of this person and a lot of our collaborators through time, um, but you'll get a chance to meet them throughout the presentations. 
So first of all, I like to introduce so one method we use uh, is individual based studies in which we follow individuals through time and that can tell us a lot about individuals themselves, but also the populations. We have three long term studies that we carry out the like us on the northern boomers, the harbor seals and the bottom of dolphins. But I will let the people that are actually running the study introduce them a bit. So I'm going to take you on a little journey up to Orkney to start with. I'm here on Nine Hallow, July 2018, a small island between Rousey over there and the mainland of Orkney, where the University of Aberdeen have been studying formers, the northern former, our small albatross, since 1950. And since that time, birds have been breeding on this cliff here at Ramna and uh, have been ringed with colouring so that we can recognise different individuals and uh, follow their reproduction and survival rates over time. One of the key aims of projects like this former study and the work that we do on the dolphins and the seals in the Murray Firth is to try and understand how these wildlife populations are responding to environmental variation. And that might be year to year variation as a result of changes in weather or fish stocks or longer term changes as a result of climate change or ocean climate change. And one of the ways we've been doing this is to follow individuals in these populations so that we're not just looking at overall changes in the numbers, but looking at how different individuals with different strategies cope under different environmental conditions. I don't know why it stopped. I'm sorry. Um, anyway, just Paul was finishing to introduce the former study. And now um, that was Professor Paul Thompson, the director of the Lighters. And now to introduce the Harvard Seals, I'm going to take you on a short uh, uh, seal survey trip up at Lock Fleet with my colleague Rebecca Hewitt. <laughs> Hi, my name is Becky and this is Willow and I'm a research assistant at the Lighthouse Field Station and the main part of my job is to run the Harbour Seal Photo ID study here at Lockfleet. So when we're at Lockfleet we make a number of counts and we've got a really good telescope to help us do that. And we also take the pictures of the individual seals and then we can match these back to a catalogue back at the Lighthouse Field Station. So I'm just going to introduce you to some of the seals we've got pulled out here at Lockfleet today. Uh, looking at this near sandbank here, sandbank one, starting on the left, we've got a mum pup pair. So on the left here we've got a pup, quite a fat, healthy looking pup. And just putting her, her head up there on the right was uh, her mum, which is number 269. 269 has been in the catalogue since 2012, uh, and we think she's roughly around 11, 12 years old. So I really hope you were able to hear bits of that. But um, as an example of the seals that you just saw in Becky's video, uh, this is another seal, so this is number 42. And thanks to the amazing work of collecting photo ID data, we're able to follow individuals uh, such as this one from 2006 and collect information on them when, when we see them and also when they're having pups. And very similar to this slide, you're probably very familiar with the work of Barbaracini at the Delighted, but we also do have a bottom of dolphins photo ID study um, and with some individuals that have been seen since 1989. And one of the great value of this long-term study is that we can follow individuals see when they're having coughs and now we see some of these coughs having come to themselves. Um, but very recently, um, Barbara, on top of taking pictures of dorsal fins, we're moving now and taking pictures from above, as this can tell us, for example, a lot more about the pregnancy status of the dolphins.
you can tell I'm really making use of all my colleagues' videos where <laughs> it made my life a bit easier today. Um, and I, another really common method that we use to study uh, marine mammals is uh, using phosphorylated monitoring. And this really involves uh, using hydrophones in the water to detect the sound they make. We use two main devices, one of which is a C-pod, which is a cetacean collocation click detector. And this is really useful to study the occurrence and foraging behavior of bottom sulfurs and arbor porpoises. But we also use sound traps. And these are broadband sound recorder, which means we actually really get audio from. So then we can extract a lot of information from such as animal vocalization, but also natural and anthropogenic noise. To give you some examples of how we've been using this, this is the work of Ayla Graham, uh, which she studied the responses of our purposes to offshore developments, in particularly um, piling using sea pods. For example, she found that harbor purposes were responding at a much shorter distance and also that decreased over time. Another example, this case, uh, the work of uh, Odbina Malagal, she looked at the responses of our purposes to vessel intensity. So this is a map of some of the AIS work that Emily just talked about in the more first. And she, for example, showed that the occurrence of our purposes and their foraging behavior decreased as this vessel um, intensity increased. And I'll talk more about some examples with the sound traps. So I've been using as well sound traps to study dolphin vocalization. So some of the vocalization we can study are, for example, whistles. They are generally used for social and communi as communication calls. If you have never heard the whistle. And you also already heard in the background some breakles, and these are burst calls that are generally being associated with feeding on salmon. And this is what they sound like. As where it is a dolphin, and you probably can guess why it's called a break hole now. Um, and then this, for example, that myself and Yana Fernandez have been involved in, and as already um, Tim hinted to, actually when you work with sound trap data, it's a really time-consuming manual process. So we have soon realized the need for an automatic detector. So both through our PhDs, we've been involved in developing Dolphin Spot, which is an automatic detector for dolphins' whistles and break holes. And this is based on previous work done on killer rails calls. And just to give you a rough idea, to process roughly 63 hours of audio, it would take 63 hours of a person doing it manually, but it only takes 42 minutes if you do it with an AI. And now, as Tim already gave it away, but uh, we are collaborating with colleagues here in the UK at Sounds, but also across the water in the States with NOAA. And we're working now towards an automatic detector for Milky Way calls, which hopefully is going to tell us a lot more about these species uh, in, around the Scottish waters. And then finally, I promise the last video, but this is just a short introduction of a multi-institutional pro um, program that a lot of the people in the rooms are also involved in, which is called Prepared, uh, that we've just joined. So I want to thank you all my colleagues uh, for their amazing work that I was able to present here today. I want to thank you all our current and the previous funders and collaborators. And of course, I want to thank you all of you for your attention today. Thank you.
Okay, I do have some notes because I'm used to talking for about 45 minutes and I don't want to keep you here that long. Um, so for those of you who haven't met me, I'm Emma and I'm one of the founding trustees of the Orkney Marine Mammal Research Initiative or OMRI because that's much, much easier to say and it's certainly easier to spell. If you're like me, you cannot type the word initiative at all and get it right first time. We're very much a local organisation, very young organisation, and I'd like to go through a little bit of our history, how we came about, and some of the projects that we're working on in Orkney with the local community. We are very, very much grassroots and community-led. Uh, we've got a wonderful group of volunteers we work with. We work with local businesses, we work with local transport um, and other people within the Orkney community to do what we do. And we, right from the word go, wouldn't be able to do it without them. So as I say, we're very young. Um, actually, we have COVID to thank for Omri. We were bored during COVID in lockdown. It was Orkney. Two of us are based in the North Isle, in the Northern Isles on Sandy. There's not a lot to do, um, and we weren't working. So we got together, and we're all a bit obsessed with marine mammals. Not going to lie, and we decided that we knew Orkney is fabulous for sightings. We know there's loads of stuff seen. We have really active Facebook groups and networks reporting all of these fabulous sightings, but nobody ever records the data. It sits there in social media and it's hugely misunderstood. We've seen reports where it's telling us that we get lots and lots of bottlenose dolphin in Orkney. We really don't. That Risso's dolphin don't really exist in Orkney. Well, we know that's definitely not true because they're one of our most recorded species. We know we get harbour porpoises, we know we get killer whales, we know we get large whales at certain times of year, but we had no idea what was actually going on. So we got together and actually founded in July 2020 and became a fully registered charity in September 2020 to try and answer these questions, to find out what is actually going on with our marine mammals in Orkney. Why are they there? How many of them are there? Where are they? What time of year? All of those questions that we want to answer. And as I say, we're very, very much a grassroots charity working in and with the local community. We've all lived in Orkney for some time. Um, and we've built up a network and without that network, we would not be getting the data. And the other very key thing is none of us are paid to do this. We are all volunteers. Uh, two of us work full time, one studies full time and the other one works part time, studies part time. And then we run on me on top of that. So it's the old age old thing. If you're busy, you'll say yes to keep doing stuff. Um, if you want a job doing, give it to someone who's busy. So very quickly, what we do, we're looking at conservation, we're looking at education within the local community to really give them ownership of what's out there and research to find out what is going on. But ultimately, it's the marine mammals that are at the center of that and the community that we live and work in. In our first two years, we've very much had the difficult second album stage that we've gone through, the difficult second year, as Karen always says. We've trained 86 folk around Orkney via our Stewards of the Sea Citizen Science Project, and we now have 72 official volunteers in both survey roles and other supportive roles, doing social media, doing data gathering, that type of thing. Um, we have a Telegram reporting group that's incredibly active. We actually filled two WhatsApp groups, which was a nightmare because we were constantly spending our time transcribing sightings from one group to the next, so we've moved to Telegram. And that's open to residents, to visitors alike, and is very widely used. We now do vessel-based surveys on Penton ferries and Orkney ferries on a regular basis. And we have a harbour porpoise project as well, which I'm going to talk very quickly about. Our first objective, though, very much was to get our baseline data out there and to let people know what was out there. We were gathering all of this wonderful data from everybody within Orkney. Our data comes from the general public. It comes from guys working on the ferries. It comes from people doing effort based surveys as well. So we wanted to put all of that together um, and we actually launched our first cetacean atlas in 2020. 452 sightings reported in 2020. Um, some of them are repeat animals seen again and again throughout a day, something like the killer whales pods as they're moving through Orkney are very well followed and we're able to track their movements. We confirmed 11 different species in 2020 that does include basking shark, we do record basking shark as well, 
at least 2,470 individual animals. The 2021 Atlas is on its way. However, we've created a bit of a monster. Our sightings levels doubled, or in fact, more than doubled in 2021 to 2020. And it's taking a long time to validate all of that data. It all goes through a very strict process to confirm its accuracy. Uh, so it is a work in progress and it is very nearly there. We had hoped to launch it today, um, but it's just taking that little bit of time. So this is what it looks like. This is all of our sightings in 2020. What you can see there is we do cover up to the North Cape Ness coast. And the reason is, if something is in the Pentland Firth, it could go either way. It could either stay in Caithness or it could come across to Orkney. So for ease, we said we'd cover up to uh, the Caithness coastline from Duncansby Head round to Holborn Head and out to the 12 mile limit, including Sula Skerry and Sula Stack as well. So we got pretty good coverage um, around the Isles. Our key project at the moment, though, is the Long Hope Harbour Porpoise Project. Uh, we've got historic anecdotal evidence of a large harbour porpoise aggregation every autumn within Long Hope Bay that's down in the southeast of Hoy in Scapa Flow. Um, but nobody knows why they're there. We know every year that everyone goes, oh, there's loads of porpoises in Long Hope again, but why? So we decided this year we're actually going to go and find out what these animals are doing there Anecdotally, we think this is the largest harbour porpoise gathering in the UK. It is huge and it is in a really tiny area and it goes on for about three months. So this year we did a six week pilot project using volunteers uh, in September and October. And over the next two years, we've got three month surveys planned as well. So very, very exciting stuff. This year, six weeks land-based and vessel-based. Um, we had 137 volunteer hours uh, on land and 40 hours vessel-based. We've got approximately 1,000 photo ID photos to go through from just six weeks. So you can guess what I'm doing this winter. And our highest day count was around 200 porpoises in that very small area. However, we have anecdotal evidence from this year that that number is possibly double that, if not more. It's a tiny area. What on earth are all of these porpoises doing there? And there's quite a few calves there. There's juveniles, there's adults, there's mating behavior being seen, there's feeding behavior being seen. These porpoises are also mugging vessels. They are coming in and interacting with vessels. Porpoises don't do that, uh, but we've got video evidence of them doing it. So very exciting. And hopefully at some point, I'll be able to talk to you a lot more about what is going on in Long Hope. And if you've got any questions or you wanna get involved, do come and see us um, and have a chat about it. But the key for today is collaboration. And what I really want to get across is we could not do this work without the help of so many people, our volunteer citizen scientists who are out there in quite literally all weathers. It rained every single survey day for them uh, in every six, every twice a week they were out. You could guarantee that was the days it was gonna rain. The Island of Hoy Development Trust were absolutely superb and they ferried our volunteers around to our survey sites. Orkney Ferries were giving us data, they were letting our volunteers travel for free uh, and they're letting us do some other surveys out to some of the other isles as well. Orkney Field Club uh, and Orkney and Shetland Charters uh, Dive Company, which are doing a lot of the vessel-based work for us. So it's been a huge collaborative project. Um, and very exciting and it is getting bigger and bigger and we're involving more and more people so again if you're someone who wants to get involved please do let us know uh, our volunteers have nicknamed themselves the porpoise posse uh, and they were absolutely superb all local um Orcade, orcadians and uh incomers to the orkney islands uh um, yeah absolutely brilliant they were wonderful wonderful but this really puts it into the wider context as well. We're working with Orkney residents across all of the Isles. Um, we're very lucky that two of us are based in the North Isles, so we've got really good links there. We're working with volunteers, recreational and commercial fishermen, the aquaculture industry, ferry companies, the local OIC council, development trusts, local businesses and local artists to really get the word out there and to gather as much data as possible. And that's allowing us to really do a lot more for SNAS, for BDMLR and other people, 
to gather data. We are perfectly placed in Orkney to get some really interesting strandings. Um, we have had one of the killer whales come in, number 151. That was a very sad uh, entanglement case. But because of our links that we've forged through Omri, we were able to get out there. It was on one of the outer aisles, no ferry to get there. If you've ever been to Orkney, you will learn very quickly. You cannot get from one northern isle to the other without going into Kirkwall. Um, but because we have good links, we were able to commandeer one of the fish farm boats to come and collect us. And we went over and were able to secure the carcass and get some early samples before Andrew came up uh, to do the full necropsy. We were also able with Orkney ferries and local volunteers on islands, able to get um, carcasses from islands where we can't normally get to. And again, the key there, collaboration that came off Orkney ferries, the instruction was, don't wrap it so it looks like a dolphin. They did a wonderful <laughs> job. Nobody would ever have guessed what it was. So the key take home here is collaboration. We work with all of these wonderful organizations, these businesses, a lot of them are Orkney based, but also from the wider field. And that really allows us to do what we do. Um, and we couldn't do it without them. However, I really must finish with a huge thank you to all of our volunteers. They're the ones who are out there gathering the data, reporting sightings to us. Uh, and so on. It takes a lot of hard work to watch the cetaceans in Orkney because of the weather, but you do it. And if there's anyone out there on Zoom watching, thank you very much. Thank you. I'd like to start first of all by saying I feel a bit of a fool, really, because my involvement with this project is very, very small and was quite a long time ago. Um, and I'm pretty sure it's the same thing that Victoria didn't got somebody from Cornwall to do videos for them. <laughs> anyway, um, so uh, as many of you may know, I, in another life, uh, I used to work in Cornwall, uh, teamed up with the LSE Arsenal TSIP team down there on strandings uh, in Cornwall. And um, uh, one well, of the main the outcomes of the work we did in Cornwall was the establishment that uh, a lot of the dolphins that we were found on the Cornish coastline were actually dying due to entanglement with fishing gear. And that was the first time that happened, which is bad for dolphins, but good that we knew it. So why do we need this project beep? Well, um, there are lots of reasons, really. And um, the main reason is only a certain number of animals were going for post-mortem. Not working, I think. Okay, sorry. Better? Anyway, yes, so so why do we need beef? Um, well, only a certain number of animals were coming post mortem, and there are many reasons for that. Um, there are uh, decomposition reasons for animals that are too decomposed uh, to get to the uh, post mortem or that are too deep, difficult to get to. So um, uh, those animals were being missed, despite the non division. That was also those animals that were when making the shores, but there was a big discrepancy in animals that were we could actually diagnose as being vital. And on top of that, we had a nice review in 2005 of Rob, well, I think that you know, someone will remember that we cut the number of animals we could examine at, uh, at uh, post mortem, which is just 100 for the entire UK, which didn't help much. Um, and I used to work for what is now the APHA, which is the Animal and Plant Health Agency. Uh, as it's known now, um, and my input was really very small, was to provide photographs of animals that had lesions that were due to entanglement, and animals that weren't, uh, had lesions that weren't due to um, uh, in, uh, in bycatch, that could be perhaps misidentified as such. And uh, this was all sort of put together, got together and was presented firstly at uh, the ECS in 2007 at San Sebastian. So who was behind it? Certainly wasn't us, certainly wasn't me, uh, but it was the Cornwall Wildlife Trust. Um, and this is just a slide that shows you really the, the degree of the problem we have in the south, the head in the southwest. As you can see, that uh, this is uh, our performance by catch cases, but as you can see in Cornwall, we really had a, a major problem there. And this is just animals that went to provide more than non animals that were left on the beach. So we really did need to get a handle on what was going on. And I must admit, when the project was first new to I was, I hate to say, against it, and not, not because I, I thought it was a bad idea, but I was always worried about doing funding. <laughs> In that, that if people were doing it free of charge and just volunteers on the on the coast doing it for nothing, that um, they may cut off funding and we wouldn't actually be able to do any post-mortem. But um, as the folk that actually designed the project pointed out to me, it didn't do post-mortem, not instead of post-mortem. So so who was it? Who was um who was it uh, 
that design well. Um, these are the people with it behind it. Any of you that work in the acoustics uh, will know, recognize the pod father here, Dr. Nitra Genza. But in addition to that, it was uh, Jan and Jeff Lowridge who uh, driving the project, and Ruth Williams and Tom Hardy, not that Tom Hardy, the other Tom Hardy. Um, <laughs> We're also uh, 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 instrumental in getting the project off the ground and getting it running. So, I mean, we were just really, our involvement was pretty limited. It was limited to really the brilliant photograph. And then getting the volunteers to go and have a look and then seeing whether they could identify the, you know, the reasons that were consistent with being brought by. Court. So, typical reasons like, you know, eviscerations, you know, where animals being cut uh, to try and sink them. Um, and then, you know, more delicate, discrete uh, lesions such as the uh, net marks over the surface of the body, certain images, uh, and bloodshot eyes, right the way to the fairly easy to identify <laughs> cases which are entangled in nets. Um, and so we provided those, and we provided um, lesions that were pretty sure, perhaps be misconstrued as uh, being due to um, bite catch, things like unspecific rate marks, marks made by animals of the same species, or bottom of dog and kill rate marks, uh, bird damage. Or excoriations where animals have come to the uh, come onto the shore, and that's really what I'm going to leave this with you. I'm going to hand it over to Denise, who will tell you all about how the project has progressed and where it's got to now and the future of it. Right, can you guys hear me? Yeah, I can hear myself anyway. Um, so I got involved in the Marine Strandings Network and Beep in 2013, where the Wildlife Trust kind of took over. Jan and Jeff Loveridge decided to, um, after 10 years of incredible work decided to step back and they handed over the project as pretty much as it is now. So we've got a dedicated training program for volunteers, not just to, not just to go out to the beach, but also to man the hotline. And that's, we say 24 hours, we ask not to really be 24 hours. Um, and then the volunteers on the beach to go down and take a, a set of photographs. So rather than relying on them in the cold and the wet and the wind and with the sand and everything like that to identify these features, just take the photographs and then we can examine these photographs in the comfort of an office, zoom in and out, take your time and properly evidence it. And that's kind of where what I did. I was under the mentorship of, of mostly Jan, but also uh, Jeff and another volunteer that they had doing it for years. Um, and uh, so they, they taught me how to do this. And it's, it, the, the learning is massive and it's constantly learning. Um, so all the cases that we identify through bycatch using Beep, we then go through uh, with a fine tooth comb with um, a vet pathologist, uh, James Barnett, at the moment. Um, moment, but James Barnett. Um, so, and then those are those are um, are analysed together with what we find from the from the post mortems. So, as as I said, it is collaborative with with post mortem um, information. It's just adding additional information on top of that. Um, so how do we do it? Basically, photographs exactly like this, it's pretty static, but we will be asked for as high quality as possible so we can zoom in and out, really, really take our time to go through them and pick out features like this. So it, diagonal marks and encircling marks, they're, they're quite classic. Um, and as I said, some of them can be quite, quite um, not very easy to identify, so it's going to take a bit of learning and a bit of scrutiny. And what we're finding um, is that beep, um, the, the proportion of cases uh, attributed to bycatch using beep is in and around what we're finding with um, with postmortem, maybe about five or ten percent difference, if that makes sense. But um, but consistently throughout uh, in the southwest, it, bycatch is looking at about twenty five to thirty percent of the cases that we that wash up can be uh, attributed to bycatch. But the problem with beep is it's not scientifically recognised. The information that we find, the information that we publish. On the annual reports, um, doesn't go beyond Cornwall or doesn't really go kind of into uh, wider level stats. Um, and this is why we've developed a program uh, called the Dolphin Bycatch Project. It's a bit kind of fluffy, but the reason why we call it something like that was to try and encourage volunteers um, to, to engage with it. Um, so the aim of the project basically is to kind of put deep through its paces. Uh, test whether or not um, it can it can actually be used for to diagnose bycatch to a level of um, accuracy um, and how we might actually improve the process um, and kind of systematically uh, set up a framework that other, other, maybe other volunt um, other stranding networks could could utilize. Uh, so this work kind of started in around 2016 2017 with a small scale trial with the Cornwall Wildlife Trust using five experts so people who have been trained very uh, through many, many years to do this. So that included Nick Tregenza, Jan and Jeff Loveridge, 
um, myself and other key volunteers that we had trained up in the office, um, as well as five volunteers from the surroundings network itself. So they're used to seeing these animals on the beach and kind of knowing what to photograph. Um, and our, our, these initial findings were about 80% accurate, which isn't too bad. And if we, if we kind of know how inaccurate it is, we can use that 20% that inaccuracy to kind of as a, as a multiplier to kind of correct, correct for. Um, and the, the project was, was designed, uh, building on this 2017 trial, um, but expanding it out. So we actually used a, built a website to try and encourage more volunteers to get involved. Um, and through the, this website provided training, uh, what to look out for, what to not to look out for, things you can get confused with, and then asked volunteers to uh, examine photographs from real stranding cases where we knew the cause of death, they didn't know the cause of death, and we asked them to, to identify what features they saw, encircling marks, um, amputations, that kind of thing, um, as well as asking them what, how, if they thought this animal had died from bycatch. Um, and the aim of the project is to, to, or to examine which external features are more important than others. Um, can trained volunteers actually diagnose bycatch using this process? Um, and is there, are there mechanisms that we can use to improve the accuracy, like kind of waiting, okay, if I had um, encircling marks, that might be there a, bit, a bit more maybe uh, reliable than little cuts on the lips, that kind of thing. So uh, adding weightings to, this, to the features that we're seeing to improve the accuracy. Um, so I'm in the middle of the stats and stuff. I'm not going to show you any graphs because uh, I'm not ready yet. But uh, some initial kind of indications that we're finding. Um, so, so far we've had over 800 volunteers get involved. Uh, about 300 or so uh, actually collected data and got to the stage where they were examining um, case photographs. Um, and on average, each case was examined about uh, 30 times. Um, and we had 197 cases where we had detailed photographs of the animal on the beach and we knew that the actual cause of death from post-mortem results. We're treating post-mortem results as the kind of gold standard. That's the best we're going to know. That's kind of, if, if that's what it says, we're taking that as kind of gospel because it's the best we have. Uh, so the, where we asked volunteers uh, whether they thought the animal was by culture caught or not, uh, we found that it actually wasn't a very good metric. Um, Again, this is exactly what we found in 2017 as well, because it's an emotive thing. People are either overcautious because they don't want to miss things or being too cautious and, um, and actually missing things. So, um, so basically, we've decided that's not a very good metric. But if we use the same data, but just looking at what features were seen and trying to use those to assess whether the animal was by cat caught or not, if we look at just the features, then we start to see something really interesting. We're starting to kind of see signals that actually we can um, diagnose by catch. Um, and even more strongly, we can discount by catch. Um, and obviously, as we're probably quite obvious, uh, some features are better than others. Um, and we're trying to understand kind of why this is, which, which ones are more important. And um, so maybe we can start to apply this weighting I was talking about. Um, and then if we do, so we, we've kind of come up with a rudimentary weighting that we've used from, from our learning down at Cornwall. Um, and we're starting to see that that again improves the accuracy of the whole thing. So this is a work in progress. I really hope that maybe in the future when we finish this and, um, and have something to show, I'll be able to come back and, and talk to you in a bit more detail about it. Um, but as is the theme of this whole thing, this project is, couldn't have been done with one, uh, all the people who developed these right at the beginning and stuck with it and drove it through, developed the whole program. Um, how am I doing for time? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Matt, but okay. Uh, yeah, so dedicated volunteers, Jenna Jeff Lovers were at volunteers and ran the program for 10 years. All the people, all the hundreds and hundreds of people on the beaches in Cornwall who've collected all these photographs. The countless hours James has spent um, necropsying all these animals and feeding into us and helping us develop and fine tune beep as, as a protocol that it is now, or as a project it is now. And, um, and everyone that got involved with the website. Um, these are people from literally all over the world. It's been really incredible. Um, so yeah, really nice project. And thank you very much. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm Karen Hall. I'm in my day job. I'm a marine mammal advisor um, for Nature Scott, but um, but probably quite obsessed, like uh, a lot of people in this room. But also, if anything comes in um, to Shetland, then I'm generally uh, first on the call. 
Um, but I would say that, again, like everybody here, the theme of co collaboration, wear multiple hats, sometimes at the same time. So it, I think everybody's aware of that, you know, wear different hats. And today we're going to talk about um, Jack, the sperm whale, who decided to take up residency in Shetland in March this year. And the sort of collaborative process we needed to take to get this animal back out to sea. Um, and it really couldn't be done without a huge raft of effort from everybody in Shetland. Um, There we go. Okay, so here's Shetland. Um, and this is uh, so the first sighting, uh, 21st of March. And firstly, it was reported as a humpback whale off the Scalloway Islands by a fish farmer. Um, photo that came in later actually confirmed it was a sperm whale. Then the second sighting was up in uh, Whitenessville and confirmed as a large whale. And then lastly, at 12 o'clock, it was, we realized it was definitely a sperm whale. And you can see at this point, although it looks quite close to the shore there, it was actually quite deep water and that's um, sort of foreshortened because I'm looking across the bow there. So that's fine. We get sperm whales in Shetland. Sometimes they die, sometimes they don't. So we're not, we're not worried at the moment. So, However, this one decided um, it quite liked being there. So on day one, you can see uh, there, day one, it was moving just back and forward, logging on the surface, doing sperm whale things. We were quite happy. And then day two, it moved a bit further north. We were beginning to get a bit nervous here. We're thinking, oh God, what's it going to do? Uh, then threw itself ashore at the Red Star at Nesbister. So that wasn't good. Day three, it resurfaced and uh, went further right up into head of the bow, very, very shallow, very, very difficult and then decided to park itself ashore again. But we'll, we'll show you what happened with the various bits there. So the first day of day two, the evening, I mean, it came ashore first. Um, so this is uh, some still some drone footage from Hugh Harrop. Um, I do have the video, which hopefully I'll be able to show this afternoon to people see because it's quite dramatic. Um, so whale came ashore, lots of splashing, really agitated, films, everything out of the water. Um, you can see there's a, a bit of commotion from the still uh, in the top right here. This is it defecating. So a huge amount of poo escapes into the water. Obviously not happy. Lots of rolling over. In some of the, the footage, you can see blood where it's scraped itself from the ground. Yeah, and in the bottom right there, you can see a lot of the silt because it's obviously disturbing the seabed. So at this point, I think I was on the phone to... Nick at the time going, oh my God, I've got a stranded sperm whale. What the hell are we going to do about it? Um, yeah, so not great. And at this point, this breathing rate was really, really um, dramatic. So it was every 15 seconds. It was obviously this total panic. So this is what it looked like from the shore. So again, you know, tails and things out of the water. Um, you can see a bit of red in the top right there where it's um, grazed itself. You can see how close it is. Um, so again, day two, evening, the bottom right there, that's how we left it. And we fully expected to come back the next morning and it to be dead. So not, not that my pet is a or not, but that tends to be what happens. However, it lived on and moved further up the bow. So we're now in the bottom right here, up here which is not great because it's very enclosed, it's very shallow, and it's, um, you know, sperm whale is obviously wanting to head north because that's what they're programmed to do at that time of year is head north. It can't go any further north, there's land, this is a problem. Still swimming, still breathing, okay, that's, that's okay, we can cope with that. And then, unfortunately, in the evening, we had what I can only describe as um, a bunch of teenage boys having a bit of a joy ride in a, a boat, who decided to park themselves um, right in the seaward side of the sperm whale. So now we were dealing with a wildlife crime incident on top of everything else. So this was a not ideal, shall we say. And it would also say in the top picture there, you can just see people standing. This is where 
it again the sperm whale decided to park itself and again I was on the phone to Nick going it's stranded again but it seems to be surrounded by water okay well, that's fine but it, it, it seems to just be I'm just resting <coughs> so yes multiple things going on however still alive day four onwards and um, essentially we, we had a very dedicated person Sharon Jack who basically spent you know, 14 hours a day watching this beast. And we got to learn its habits. And it basically was doing this route around some of the deeper part of the hole. So it would hang around off this point. It would then go through the narrow channel and then hang around this area here, which the locals knew as the fishbowl, which is where all macron things would congregate. And gradually it would begin to, you begin to see it sort of, it was obviously learning where the depth profile was. So it didn't ever strand again. And it would just uh, hang out there, it's breathing, it would go from sort of breaths every minute or so, and then it would have a quiet period when it was having a sleep. And it would go to 10 to 15 minutes between breaths. And we just got to know its patterns, where it was going, what it was doing. We spent a lot of time hanging around at graveyards. I often say to our show watch volunteers, we're always hanging around in lay, lay buys, but this particular one, it was graveyards we were hanging around in for our observation points, so that made a change. So I guess the thing, clear thing here was that it had this fill down here to try and get across to get back south. And even though it was going down that way, it would always stop. So we were getting increasingly sort of, is this thing going to make it out of here by itself? But it was alive, we'll just do, we'll just let it be. The other thing I want to highlight on this slide is this boy here which was roughly up in the far right corner of the, the map. One day it decided it took a dislike to this boy and actually smashed it. And at that point we were like, oh no, we've got an entanglement case, which <laughs> with this stage, I'm a nervous, right? But um, just to highlight some new technologies and things that are really helping, um, on, from the shore, we couldn't see the boy attached to it, but we got the drone up and the drone was like, no, it's not attached with it, and it's hanging over there. And then we're able to get somebody local with a small boat in to retrieve the, the boy out of the way. So that was that was really useful. So it's hanging around. It's not going to leave by its own accord, but it seems to be otherwise perfectly healthy. We have to start planning a bit of an attack of how can we get this thing out of here? Can we get this thing out of here? What, what possible options do we have? So a great team effort. And when we started mentioning that perhaps we should you know, we could maybe think about this, we had um, help coming from everywhere. People saying, oh, what do you need? And it was absolutely amazing. In particular, Scotch Sea Farms were just like, we've got lots of vessels, just tell us what you need. Absolutely brilliant. So we, um, we had a, a lots of planning meetings to because obviously this is quite a risky activity um, we weren't sure how the whale was going to react um, and we weren't sure we weren't even sure if it would react at all so we had to sort of think through all the possible scenarios the main thing was trying to make sure that it didn't if we got it out if we were lucky enough to get out of this bowl it didn't just suddenly turn around and then head up some of these other boats because just thought this is going to be an absolute nightmare so um, lots of discussions. Ideally, we wanted to go down the east side of the bow. It didn't. So there we go. I have a moving sperm whale. There we go. Um, and we worked with the uh, Scalloway Port Authority and everybody to make sure they had vessels under control. Then amongst all this, um, we had to try and think about getting small boats into the fishbowl. So, because we thought if we were trying to put all these large boats in, it was going to end up the boat, the whale ashore. And we were trying to put out information because everybody had an opinion and wanted to know what was going on. Day nine, after our planning meeting, we actually had a, a opportune moment where um, the whale was right down near the, the southern point of Nesbister approaching the sill and we thought let's just try these small boats which we've got permission to see if it will actually make a difference and it did and the whale moved down just just south of the sill and we're like hallelujah but it was eight o'clock at night and we couldn't see it anymore so we, we had to sort of cross fingers and hope that the next day 
it would still be in the position. Day 10, we got there, it's snow on the ground, it's freezing the Baltic, and I'm about to get dragged off, but tough. <laughs> and um, the, it stayed south, so we started gently moving it south with small boats, and a big shout out to Martin Robinson and the small boat here, who was absolutely brilliant. You can see the snow showers coming down the bow. All very, very calm, um, just moving it down. Again, drone footage all the way down to make sure that we were monitoring it. It would do the same behavior where it would be active for a couple of minutes, and then it would have a 10 minute period where it just wanted to relax. So we just let it do its thing. And there you, you see the, the route we finally took. However, we had a small moment of panic at the scary here where there's a small jetty. And you can see in the bottom right there um, what we were seeing from the shore where the whale decided to park itself. But unfortunately, when we're looking from the drones, it was actually ashore and then we managed to get it out. So huge list of people to thank. And um, I put these up just to say that it's not just organizations, it's individuals that work as teams and come together as teams. So just feel free to see that. I went to the local school and they were just brilliant and I'm getting approached and I get a bit nervous. <laughs> and yeah, some thoughts just for me, final thoughts. Basically, you can't do these things by yourself. You need to have a team. You will get lots of opinions. Sometimes you just have to go with your gut and just do it. And it doesn't, doesn't matter what organization you're representing. At the end of the day, pick one and just go with it. Anyway, thank you very much. All right, can everybody hear me? I can hear like a weird echo. Um, thank you very much for having me here this morning. It's an absolute honor to be here with so many passionate, wavy people. Um, it's a bit of reverb. I, I'm told I have to kind of step away from the large cetacean this way. Okay, cool. Um, so I want to talk to you today about storytelling. And already this morning, I've heard so many incredible stories from all our amazing speakers um, and amazing things, amazing ways that we can engage people about the marine environment. Now, storytelling has been around since the start of civilization. It's something that we humans have taken on in many different forms for many, many, many thousands of years. Um, and I think in this setting here, it's a brilliant way that we can use our voice. We can use our voices to talk about the things that we're passionate about, the things that we know about, and the things that we think other people need to know about. So we can talk about um, all the things that we're uh, particularly knowledgeable about to people both within our circles, so like you guys, and also outside of our circles. And that's one of the most important things I think at this point in time is that we're reaching people outside of our echo chambers and how we do that is really important. And I think stories have a really important role to play in that. So, do, do, do. why? Why do we need to tell stories? Why do we need to communicate everything that we're hearing here today and everything that we talk about in our own circles anyway? Well, there's an environmental crisis. Don't know if you've heard about it, but we're told, told about it all the time. We're constantly told, told about these climate and biodiversity crises. And there's a lot of doom and gloom there. There's a lot of negativity. It's paralyzing and it can be a massive turn off to the very people that we're trying to reach with our stories. And so I think finding positive, engaging and optimistic ways to tell stories is a really, really powerful way that we can communicate messages that need to be taken out to the broader public. And why do they need to be taken out to the broader public? Because as well as having all of you guys on board with these important topics, we need every single member of the public that we can possibly reach to be on board with it too. And I think the way to do that is by relating to people on different levels. And that's going to be very, very different for different members of the community. It's going to, you know, the stories that I tell to you guys personally might be very different to the stories that I tell to other, other parts of, of society. And we have to find ways to relate to people on individual levels with different ways of telling our stories. I think it's particularly important at a marine forum because the marine world is out of sight and out of mind to the vast majority of the public. A lot of the time when we try and engage people in the marine world, 
they can't relate to it because a lot of people have never had the privilege that a lot of us have had to actually be underwater or to see sperm whales. And so communicating that to people and finding a way to help them experience the marine world as well is really, really important. So for me, um, I have a bit of a unique way of telling stories, which is from a stand-up paddleboard. Um, I started taking on paddleboarding adventures um, whoa, too long ago now, um, about six or seven years ago, and using adventures as a way, as a vehicle to deliver positive messages. I was finding that there was heaps and heaps of info in my echo chambers about plastic pollution and about biodiversity loss, but a lot of it was really negative and I wanted to deliver a positive message of the solutions that we can all be engaged in. And so I took to my paddleboard and started doing paddleboarding adventures. I paddled around Cornwall, I paddled from Land's End to John O'Groats, around the Isle of Skye, and then last year around Scotland. And I found that it gave me the opportunity to relate to people in a different way. It gave me a, a vehicle and a platform to talk to people about what I cared about. And it gave me the opportunity to immerse myself into the environments that I wanted to talk to people about as well. Um, I found that completely inadvertently, it made me incredibly vulnerable. I was very humbled by a lot of the things I've seen on my expeditions, a lot of the experiences I've had, the times Mother Nature has kicked my ass, and being vulnerable like that and taking people on a journey with me through my adventures has given me the opportunity to talk to people about things that I don't think I'd have otherwise been able to, find ways to engage people in ways that I wouldn't have otherwise engaged, engaged them. Um, do, 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 excuse me. I normally speak for quite a long time, so I'm trying to like fit it all in. So I've got like bullet points that I have to pack. So sorry, excuse me for looking at my notes. Um, so really important point, hope and optimism. So like I said, we're, we're faced with these really doomy, gloomy crises. We use the word crisis a lot, but how do we in, nurture hope and optimism within that? And, and why is that important? Well, I think it's important because it's much more engaging when there is hope. If we can't find hope in, in something, then you know, people are not going to be motivated to act. If there's absolutely no hope, then there's no reason to act. So we have to find that hope and optimism. We have to use solution-based messaging, I think, a lot of the time in, in our communications and in the way we tell stories. Um, and this isn't just naive optimism. This isn't just putting on a brave face or putting a positive spin on things. This is optimism based on events like this, where there are, I don't know how many, you know, 100, 100 more people in the same room, all with the same passion, doing incredible things to protect our marine environment in individual ways that are collaborating and creating real tangible positive change. That's hopeful, that's optimistic. And they're the kind of stories that we need to be getting out there, not just the, you know, the, the planet's going to hell on a handcart type messaging, this kind of stuff that's happening today. Um, I also think communicating just how resilient nature can be if we give it the chance to restore and to regenerate. You know, our oceans have these incredible capacities to regenerate if we just take away some of the human pressure. And so finding ways in to find hope and optimism um, can help create a more engaging story. So I wanna tell you about a couple of stories. Um, so when I was paddling around Scotland last year, I was paddling on the northeast coast around Leibster, just near Leibster, and saw a big floaty thing about a mile offshore and paddled out to find a dead humpback whale. Um, and um, if anyone wants to know more about it, please find me later. I don't have time to talk too much about it today, but suffice to say, I was absolutely devastated. Um, I'd never seen a humpback whale in the wild before. So my first experience of one being dead was pretty um, heartbreaking. And the fact that it was a juvenile and entangled in fishing gear was even more heartbreaking, not only because it was then very conflicting for me. I was, you know, trying to tell these stories about the marine environment and about how we can protect it. And here was a whale entangled in one of the most sustainable fishing methods that we have in Scotland. Um, and I made the mistake of putting this, well, it wasn't a mistake, I put this photograph online and the response was enormous, the response was complete outrage, but there was also a lot of shaming and blaming. And that really taught me that actually when we're telling stories, we need to tell the whole picture. We need to talk not only about how, you know, fishing gear is entangling cetaceans, but how there is a huge community of people coming together to help tackle this and that there is dedication and passion and genuine concern and genuine care for our marine environments from the fishing community, not just a load of fishermen who don't care, who are putting creels in the water without a second thought. 
So that was a real lesson for me to actually make sure that the whole story is told where it's important to include nuances within that story as well. And it was also really annoying for me because for months and months and months, I've been banging on about the seabed. I've been trying to talk to people about the Three Mile Limit campaign, about protecting the seabed from bottom trawling and scallop dredging. And nobody cared. Nobody was engaging in these posts at all. And I, yet it was one of the most important campaigns I'd ever got my, you know, I'd ever heard about. Um, and despite the fact that the seabed is as important for cetaceans as, you know, things like entanglement, you know, protecting the seabed can be as, is as important for the entire ecosystem, including the cetaceans, this kind of thing just didn't get the same reaction. And it's because it's out of sight and out of mind. And so there's this real contrast between an individual cetacean being entangled and killed versus the systematic destruction of our entire seabed around Scotland. And the response seems completely inappropriate based on the, on the two. Um, and it's because like we all love whales, right? Like whales are ace, they're charismatic, they're mammals, we anthropomorphize them, we see them on David Attenborough things, just jumping out of the water, we talk about how intelligent they are, and I think we have so much more capacity to relate to something like a cetacean than a bit of merle or a flame shell. Um, and I think this is where we have to really use our charismatic species, we have to just use and abuse how much we love them. The big picture is massively overwhelming. We, we're faced with these global crises that need massive, massive solutions. But actually, we can, if we can focus on the local stories to tell the big picture, that can be a way of getting our message across. I'm going to start speaking even faster than I forgot one minute, one minute left. So, ingredients of a good story make it relatable, be vulnerable. That's something I've learned over the years. My storytelling has honed massively, has been honed massively. And I think. It was very, very hard for me at first to be vulnerable with my emotions and with what I was doing. But it's that when I am vulnerable with stories, that is when it, people can relate to it most. So I know a lot of you are scientists and maybe you think there's no place for vulnerability in your work, but I disagree. I think, you know, we, we need to be vulnerable. We need to be relatable. Find a good character. It doesn't have to be a human. It can be a cetacean. It can be a, a beautiful seabird um, and utilize them. Appeal to the senses, like storytelling, a lot of my storytelling is through film or through photographs. I'm very fortunate that my boyfriend is a professional filmmaker, which is, um, which is brilliant for the stories that I want to tell. But find ways to appeal to the senses, visual senses, um, how people feel when you tell them a story. They say that, you know, people won't remember what you said, but how you've made them feel. So appeal to the senses as much as you can. Take people on a journey, get them actually in, on board with you, going through that with you. Uh, and as I said, find a way to make it hopeful and optimistic. Um, impact storytelling. I don't think I'm gonna have much time to go over this, but basically this is the concept that you can, you can tell stories just with the goal of having a story told because you want people to know about it because you want to raise awareness. But impact storytelling is storytelling, oftentimes films where you have a specific goal at the beginning of that storytelling journey. And this is really, really impactful. So if you've got a particular campaign, there is an entire structure to tell that story, whereby you're basically working towards a big goal, but this project is towards a specific goal that helps towards that big goal. Um, and finding a way to make it measurable and make those call to actions measurable is really valuable. And finding a way to be able to actually see, well, have the people who I've reached with the story actually take on that call to action. So finding specific measurable ways to measure the impact. Kate Marielle says she's about to drag me off. Excellent. Um, and last of all, what do what do your what do your audience value? I'm just going to sh shimmy along because she's not have to drag me so far. What do your audience value? Speak to those people. Every story is going to reach a different person on a different level. You can't expect to engage an entire community with one story. You have to be able to find different ways to reach different people. And you all have it within you. I know that every single person is going to find a different way to tell different stories to different people. They're all valuable. They're all valued. Um, and really, really shamelessly, um, I would love to help tell some of these stories. So if you have stories that you want to tell that you think need to be told, please come and find me. I'm starting a podcast next year and we're making lots more films. And I want to tell these stories because they're really important. So if I can help, please come and find me. Thank you very much.
hi everyone, my name is Ellie McLennan and I'm a PhD student at the University of St Andrews where my research focuses on large marine animal entanglement in fishing gear in our intro waters and I also coordinate a project called the Scottish Entanglement Alliance or SEA. Um, so I'm going to spend the next few minutes uh, firstly giving you an overview of the work to date of the SEA project um, and then an overview of some of my own current research and then also some other really exciting work that's currently going on in this field. I'm sorry I wasn't able to attend the forum in person myself, but I really hope that those of you who were there had some time to speak with Bally and Hayden from the Scottish Creole Fishermen's Federation and Booney from British Divers Marine Life Rescue, who've all been involved in a lot of the work that I'm about to talk about and who had some really cool um, kit with them at the forum, which is currently being trialled and tested as possible mitigations to reduce entanglement risk. Um, so the Scottish Entanglement Alliance was established in early 2018, and it's a partnership between the six different organisations listed at the bottom here. So a nice mix of industry, research and conservation bodies. And the goal of this collaboration is to work closely with Scotland's inshore creole fishing industry to provide a coordinated and comprehensive monitoring um, and engagement programme to get a better understanding of both the scale and impacts of marine animal entanglements in our waters and to work towards developing strategies to reduce entanglement risk. So just to give you a little bit of background, um, what we know from the data available is that entanglements occur all around our coastline, as you can see from the map um, in the bottom right there, which is using SMAS data. Um, and unfortunately, the incidence and severity of entanglement seems to be increasing, and that raises both conservation concerns um, at a population and species level, but also welfare concerns for the individual animals involved. Um, concerns were also raised by industry. So the reason we focused on the creole fishing sector is that it was the Scottish Creole Fishing Federation who came forward um, and basically said, we think we might have a bit of a problem here. Is there something that we can do to address it? And Creole fishing in every other regard is considered a very sustainable method of fishing, um, but it is a sector that's largely unregulated. Um, and by that, I mean that there's no real limit on the number of creels that can be deployed and um, how often they have to be tended to, etc. But what we do know is that fishing effort within the creel sector has increased in recent years, which in turn sort of means that the entanglement risk has also increased. Um, there's also concerns for fisher safety. So encountering an entangled animal is an incredibly dangerous situation to be in. Um, they're wild, they can inflict a lot of damage to boats and to fishing gear. So there are both human safety and financial implications that we wanted to consider as well as part of this project. And then finally, there are obligations under various government legislation to address entanglement, and that includes commitments to reduce and, where possible, eliminate bycatch and entanglement of sensitive species, and that includes cetaceans and sharks. So each project partner bought uh, brought with them different expertise to the collaboration. So we all took on different areas of research. Um, so SMAS reviewed the distribution trends and welfare impacts of marine animal entanglements. Um, we also focused on gathering fishermen's knowledge of their own fishing practices, any experience that they'd had of entanglement and what the consequences of these events were, both to themselves and the animals. Um, Hebrody and Whale and Dolphin Trust led some species-specific work on the spatial distribution of minke whale entanglement risk, and we also worked closely with the industry to gain a wider perspective in regard to possible mitigation measures that the sector may be willing to implement. So um, what we found from this work was that entanglements occur much more often than we thought. They affect a much wider range of species than we previously thought. Um, and there's a lot of underreporting of entanglement, so we're only really seeing a fraction of those that actually occur. Um, we also discovered that different species are affected in different ways, um, and they, they are also becoming entangled in different parts of the gear, which was a really interesting finding. Um, so that all sounds very uh, doom and gloom, <laughs> but the good news is that over 80% of the fishermen who were interviewed as part of the project, and it was over 150 fishermen, um, over 80% of them provided suggestions um, to reduce entanglement risk that they would be willing to consider, to train in, to support and or to trial. And this included things like the use of sinking ground lines and so-called on-demand or ropeless systems, along with a whole suite of other suggestions. So that's really positive. 
Um, you can read the full findings of the project on our website, scottishentanglement.org. So there is a project summary document there. If you're really keen, you can read the full project report that was published through Nature Scott. And there's also some resources that we developed um, during the first two years of this project available there as well. Um, so something else that came out of this project is this paper, which was recently accepted to Endangered Species Research. Um, and this paper gathered together the information gathered through the Sea Project, um, strandings information from SMAS, and also entanglement reports from British Divers and Marine Life Rescue to come up with an estimate of the number of minke and humpback whale entanglements that might be occurring in our waters each year. Um, the paper's not yet released. We'll let you all know when it is, and it's really worth a read. Um, but the reason I've included it here is this is some of the feedback that we re received from the reviewers, and it really just highlights how important collaboration is when you're dealing with a very complex issue like entanglement. So we were really pleased to get this feedback and um, that kind of recognises the collaborative approach that we've taken with this work. Um, so moving on, as I said, I'm currently studying for a PhD at the University of St Andrews. Um, this is the title of it, and it's very much continuing on some of the work that was begun during the C project. So I have three main research chapters um, that I've split the project into, and the common theme running through these is risk. So I am overlaying lots of different data sets um, to try and find a measure of entanglement exposure. So basically combining fishing effort and intensity with um, sightings of large marine wildlife to try and map the spatio-temporal distribution um, of the two and where um, animals may be exposed to a higher entanglement risk. I'm also looking at the welfare implications of entanglement uh, using data from SMAS and working very closely with SMAS. So we will be using the post-mortem pathology um, to see what this can tell us about the characteristics, origin and chronicity of entanglement in cetaceans. And then the third chapter is going to be utilising fishermen's knowledge again. So this chapter is still evolving. I've started with some survey work, which is centred around gear use, loss, recovery and disposal within the creel sector. It received a brilliant response and um, I'm still working my way through the analysis, but hopefully I'll have something um, to share on this in the near future. Um, so other work that's going on in this field at the moment as well um, is being conducted by some of the sea partners. So Bali and Hayden from SCFF, who were at the forum, have been um, conducting some trials of weighted line in collaboration with Whale and Dolphin Conservation and Nature Scott. Um, and they're also working with Harriet Watt University to develop a low cost Creole fishery specific acoustic release um, System. So both of these ideas could help reduce the amount of slack rope that's in the water that animals can swim into. Uh, Booney from British Divers Marine Life Rescue's uh, large whale disentanglement team was also at the forum um, and he's recently back from the States and had brought with him two of the on-demand systems that are currently being trialled out there. Um, so some really exciting work going on at the moment. Um, so... Following the theme of, of the forum this year, um, I guess the key question is why was collaboration so important here? So none of the work that I've just touched on would have been possible without collaboration between fishermen, researchers, engineers, policy people, welfare advocates, pathologists, volunteers, a whole host of folk. Um, and that's because entanglement is such a complex and multifaceted issue from understanding the mechanisms by which animals become entangled, which seems to vary by, by species, um, to the risks posed by different gear configurations, even within the same fishing sector, to the consequences of entanglement, both for the animal and to the fisherman whose gear is involved, um, to the opinions on fisheries management decisions and mitigation measures, which depends on where your interests in and drivers behind solving this issue really lie. So what this all means is there's no one size fits all solution to entanglement. Um, and the collaborative approach that we adopted by sea and which I'm trying to adopt through my PhD um, allows you to combine everybody's expertise and that opens up discussion, debate, sharing of ideas um, and data. It encourages us to work together and um, help dispel some assumptions that we maybe had about one another and um, to really focus on the shared end goal. And the result that we have found, um, particularly through the C project, is that we've been able to come up with a set of proposals in terms of next research steps to focus on that everybody could agree on, support and get involved in. So we're now looking for funding to continue this work and um, hopefully we will have more updates to share with you soon.
Um, but thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much to the forum organisers. And if you would like to know more, please visit our website or you can contact me on the email address there. Thank you.